This is Jocko Podcast number 193 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. I I often say that I was raised in the SEAL teams. And I was, actually. I mean, I didn't join the Navy until I was 18 years old. But once I was in, the teams was the only thing I knew. And when I got in, what happened when you got to a team was you got in line. You got on board with the program. You got taught how to act. Not just how to fire and maneuver, not just how to shoot, move, and communicate. You got taught how to act. How to carry yourself. The attitude you're supposed to have. You got turned into a frogman. Now, there was no there was no explicit course of instructions. No one's given classes on on mental toughness or anything like that, but you were you were indoctrinated in other ways. You were taught the old ways. Then you heard stories and you'd read stories about the NCDUs, the Naval Combat Demolition Units and the underwater demolition teams and you'd hear about their incredibly brave work in World War II and you'd hear about the massive casualties that they would suffer making the beaches safe for amphibious landings. And that, that frogman heritage certainly ran deep. But at its core, the lineage that we followed, that we emulated, and that we worshipped as young seals was the Vietnam SEALs. They were the standard, without question. And I was lucky, because when I got to the teams, there were still some Vietnam SEALs around. Some of them were on active duty, they were at the teams, they were in training departments, or they were master chiefs, or warrant officers, or some of them were senior officers. Matter of fact, the admiral in charge of the community when I got in was a Vietnam guy. But there weren't that many. And when they spoke, we listened. And when they taught us something, we took notes. And they taught us the things that we needed to know. The tactics, the techniques, the immediate action drills, the standard operating procedures. And they also kept us honest because this is the 80s and this is the 90s and there's no war going on. And there were some flare-ups around the globe. And SEALs got some flashes of combat action, but there was no sustained operations. And we could have slacked off. But the old breed knew. They knew that it was only a matter of time before war would come again. And they wanted us to be ready. And when the time came, they were ready. And we were ready because of them because of those Vietnam era SEALs that had continued to serve and continued to pass on the lessons and the knowledge to the younger generations. And because of them, we were ready to take the fight to the enemy. And we did. Like our forefathers, that's what we did. And it is an absolute honor today to have one of the longest serving SEALs clocking in at 47 years, the last Vietnam SEAL to be on active duty. And he's here with us tonight. Master Chief Kirby Harrell. Master Chief, welcome Hello. to the show and thanks for coming on, man. Hello, guys. How you doing? I'm, I'm honored to be here and honored to, uh, to talk to all of your supporting people out there uh, and let them know what my story is. And what a great story it is, and what a <laughs> wonderful life I've had. As I told the vice president the other day, um, I said, you know, I'd still be doing this job 
if I wouldn't have got old. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the only drawback, man. We all get old. It's the John Wayne theory. And if you know what that is. What's the John Wayne theory? None of us get out of here alive. Oh, check. Yeah, you know, that's, that the, that's the deal. But where do I start? Let well, me let where, me go. Where do you start? Let's start with wherever you grew up. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Missouri, farm boy. Uh, moved to the big city. Started building hot rods. Which big city? St. Louis. Okay, that's that's, that's the, the only, only big one city. in Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> they think other ones are, but it's not. So, <laughs> so what year? What year was this that you were moving to St. Louis? And oh building yeah, hot rods? probably around 62, 63. You know, and I, uh, that's where I went to high school. Okay, so I was going to say, so yeah. you're in high school? Yeah, in high school at the time. And and COE was a, a big thing in those days where you, you go to high school in the morning, get your math, arithmetic, English, and then you go work at noontime mm-hmm. at, a, at a job site, right, and get a trade. Kind of something they're coming back to now because kids need trades, mm-hmm. right, today. So I had a trade, but I worked at County Speed Shop, so it fit perfect with my— uh, At County what? County Speed Shop. It oh, was okay. A, it was so, a speed shop that, it, yes. <laughs> that built drag cars, built track cars, everything else. And I had a, uh, I had a '55 Chevy yeah. that I uh, had built up, had run um, liquor from dry counties to uh, <laughs> to wet counties when I was uh, living in Arkansas. It paid the bills, so that was good. And so when I got back to Missouri, I started building bigger and faster motors, and I would uh, take the car down and and race for money down on the river flats, right? Well, I got caught one too many times, and the judge said, young man, I have some options for you. Well, I just finished reading the book Frogman, and I said, you know what, Your Honor, I think that going to the Navy thing is going to be a good deal. So he said, here's my number. If your recruiter doesn't call me tomorrow, I'm putting a bench warrant out for you. Dang. So I went to sign up for the Navy the next morning, was on an airplane that evening, headed for San Diego, <laughs> and the change of my life, right? This is what kids think it's going to be like nowadays, and it's not like that anymore. No, it's, it's not, not like all. that. Matter of fact, if you get in trouble, you're not getting in the Navy, and you damn sure aren't getting in the SEAL teams. If you have any kind of record, they don't want you. Absolutely. The other thing that happens is guys think, oh, well, I'm just going to join, and then I'll be gone the next day. It's like, no, you're going to have six months, eight months of waiting yeah. around before you go. Completely different world. Yeah. And you got to remember the Vietnam War was so was how old were you? I was uh, 18 when that happened. <sighs> and, and how close attention were you paying to Vietnam at the time? Uh, not really a lot. I was paying more attention to hot rods and building fast cars, you know. <laughs> and uh, and then when this thing came up and I uh, I had to kind of shift gears, uh, realize that I was in the Navy now. Came and this up, is 1967. 67. So Vietnam's full. I mean, Vietnam's oh, yeah. on right now. It's on. It's going. So the um, I got out here and went to boot camp at NTC here in San Diego. And in those days, you had to go do a ship tour or a Westpac tour before before you could come to the teams. Oh, it wasn't coming right out of boot camp and going to Bud's, right? So I had to do a Westpac. And you know, my job on the Westpac was a fireman because I happened to be the shortest guy and could crawl inside the boilers. <laughs> and I went, wow, what a good deal what this is. What did you is. weigh back then? Oh, uh, probably about 130. Check. Yeah, 130. I'm strong as as bull, right? <laughs> I could do 30 pull-ups and not even bat an eye, and, and I'll tell you how that worked out for me when I was in training. <laughs> so then the uh, – so I was on the ship, and uh, the, the cool part about it is I didn't stay in the fire room a long time because – the people that were taking care of the captain's gig didn't know how to set the rack on a slant six mm, Detroit diesel. Check. I knew how to set that. <laughs> so they got me out of the far room to come up and be the captain's gig. So uh, engineer. So that was a good deal. So are you an E1, E2? E2 at the time. Check. Yeah, yeah. Big, man. Big, big rate. Big rate. <laughs> so, so it's very cool. I got the job. The boat was running great. The first day, uh, the job, right, on the and I was on the USS Piedmont. You had to run out on the big booms that, that swing out from the mm-hmm. ship, so they'd tie up all the captain's gigs and mm-hmm. all of the officer's motorboats and stuff like that. Well, the first day, I just had taken my white tennis shoes out of the washer. They were still pretty slippery. I'm running out on the boom, slip, do a backflip from about 30 feet in the air into the water, 
swim over, jump on the captain's gig, and stand in where the engineer stands all the time. And, and Captain Davies, who was, the, was also a short captain, he starts applauding off the quarter deck, and he goes, Jesus, that was the best, man. <laughs> so needless to say, him and I became great friends, great friends, and, uh, and that lasted for six months. And, and then when I got back, I did my, um, my BUDS training um, qualifications over in the PI. Did those over in the PI when I got back to San Diego. I was expecting to go right to class, right? Not the case, because my lieutenant had hidden the chit that I'd pushed through. And I, fortunately, I knew the captain. So Captain Davies kind of made that all right. But I still ran from 32nd Street over to Bud's training many times trying to get all that started out. It was just good training. Mm -hmm. But um, then I got over to, to the training and uh, Captain Adi, who was over there, goes, man, you just made it just in time to start Class 49, right? Well, all the pre-training that we have nowadays that kind mm -hmm. of prepare you for all that stuff, mm -hmm. eh, wasn't there. So like three days in the training, my legs are like ready to fall off. And and so was everybody else's, right? Class 49 started. So how many, so what, you checked in on what day? Like how how was it, how long was it before you actually classed up and uh, went? Like I a, started on, I, well, I, I got there on a Thursday we started training on a Monday. <laughs> okay, so that that was the pre-training I got. Get the your weekend. get your <laughs> ass your ready. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that was the whole thing, man. So it was very cool. A very cool. All of them. And all this stemmed from the fact that you had read the book, The Frogman. Oh, absolutely. And you said, that's what I want to do. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what I want Were you a water to... guy? Did you not really in the lakes or anything? Not really. The first time I was in the ocean was here in San Diego. And I had a couple of surfers guys that were in the class because I was trying to jump over the waves because the only swimming I'd ever done is rivers and lakes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and was okay with that. But uh, I hadn't dealt with surf before. And the surfers in the <laughs> class go, no, Kirby, you got to dive underneath the waves. And I went, oh, shit, okay, got it. So underneath the waves I went, and, and it was great, man. I think once I got my fins, I felt like you know, I was a water baby then because uh -huh. I, I could fly with the fins. I never go near the ocean without my fins anymore <laughs> anyway. So, so it was very cool. So we got so we got started. I mean, there was 220, 25 of us that started class 49. And and my nemesis was, was Oliveira, and this came out at my retirement, right? Oliveira was this big hook-nosed Indian guy that ran like 100 miles, and he was strong as an ox and, and ugly as an ape. Was he right? an instructor or was he a, another total, student? Total instructor. Got it. Total instructor, him and Mother Moy. Mother Moy was also an instructor. Our class 49 was Mother Moy's first class, right? Ooh. So we're all standing out in front, you know, of the of the building over on the old amphib base, and um, we're all lined up there. Well, Oliveira comes out and starts looking up and down the line, and he goes, "Say, hey, you're too short to be here." And I went, "I'll be here when you're gone." Dang! Oh, that hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I ate half the mud on the bottom of San Diego Bay, man. It was wild. But Oliver and I, we had, we grew a relationship while I was going through training. So, being the shortest guy that ever went through Bud's training, right? I, I felt all. How the, tall are you? Five four. All the some days, other days I'm five three. <laughs> now that I'm getting older, I'm, I'm probably going to push five two pretty soon. <laughs> But he has some more stories about that. But so the uh, so Oliveira walks in the back of the of the main office and tells Mother Moy, "Hey, Mother Moy, I think you got a troll in this class." <laughs> <laughs> and, and and Mother Moy goes, "No, you're shitting me." He goes, "Well, go out there and look." And and there I was, man. It was wild. It was, that that started the whole cascade of of situations right <laughs> but so you talk shit to an instructor that's oh yeah i just want to advise people that could go okay it could also go terribly wrong because oh, totally. if you piss off an instructor they will they will they can crush you and destroy you so that's exactly he obviously right. saw something in you that he liked right but if he wouldn't have seen that you know they'll, well, they'll eat you alive well i i can only tell you that every day of training Every day of training, I was in the goon squad. So, <laughs> so that may have been part of that, what you're saying, he didn't like me kind of thing, because no matter where I was at, if I was running in the middle of the pack, 
everybody from me back was in the you, you good the squad. You were the cutoff for the good I was, squad. <laughs> I was the cutoff. I could, I, one day we just said, okay, I'm going to run in front of the pack, right? And everybody in the class goes, okay, that's great, because we had whittled the class down a lot. So I was in the front of the pack. No shit. The whole class was in the good squad. <laughs> Oliver, he was great. He was a hard, hard man. But and I'll tell you, the and it goes back to to what I was saying earlier about pull ups. So we do PT, and I could I could run hard and do a lot of PT. And I when it came to pull ups, I could knock out thirty pull ups with nothing flat. Well, Mother Moy and Olivero used to make me hang on the pull up bar. And that hit me in the stomach and see how high they could make me swing. <laughs> and I go, man. Everybody in the class will tell you that. Mike Thornton, Mike Thornton was in my class, he'll tell you that. You know, so some of the other some of the other tidbits about going through training, Mike Mike Thornton, because the dirty name is built for big guys, tall guys. Because I'm short, I got a big chest. The top log on the dirty name. I couldn't get over sometimes. I just would couldn't do it. Well, Mike Thornton would come up there and throw me over the top <laughs> log, and, and the instructors would get pissed off and go, "Thornton, you stop doing that." Where, where would he stand? Would he do that? Would he stand? Stand on the, stand on the log. You know, he'd stand <laughs> just, on the lower log and throw me over the top log. It was great. It was great. And the uh, and the days I couldn't do it, the instructors made me go through the weaver twice. Uh, but every, all the rest of the, no problem with any of the rest of the obstacles, but that was part of it. You know, and the personality, I think my personality kept me going because it, uh, it was a good thing. And the instructors, even though I was pissing them off, they, they enjoyed having me there. Because when it came to, to being, you know, making sand cookies and, and volcanoes and stuff, well, if they got too close, they became part of the sugar cookie and the volcano. And they're going, Harrell, we hate you. <laughs> so, so it was very cool. Oliver bought me a steak after after uh, after graduation, so that must have meant something, right? Dang. And and uh, Mother Moy, uh, today one of my best friends. He, you know, he comes to every event. He was at the uh, at my retirement. You know, when I retired um, from the Navy, I had uh, I had like five speakers that all came up and, and shared their their comments about Kirby as he went through training. And Mother Moy was one of them. So it was classic 1,500 people at my retirement. Yeah, yeah, huge, huge. But anyway, after after we got through BUDS, you know, then we went to, um, we went to um, SBI. How many guys made it through? You yeah, know? in our class, there were 22. So you started with 220 and you ended with 22. Yeah, probably 10%. But I got rolled back into class 50, same kind of thing. That's where What did you get rolled for? Uh, <laughs> because there was a uh, a chief chief rose who was one of our instructors good guy but he had come up with this little thing called the little olympics where you had to do the all these different exercises like swim you had to swim 500 yards in your clothes you had to do push-ups setups pull-ups and run a half mile or a mile and a half in your clothes and you had to do that all in a thousand seconds right so i missed it by like 12 seconds and he goes, sorry, we're going to have to roll you back. Dang. And I went, oh, crap. <laughs> well, I wasn't the only one. There were like five guys in the class that got rolled How back. How far along were you in training? How oh, many we weeks? went through second phase. We had to go through second phase, dive phase again, and then go uh, into the third phase. But, you know, third phase to me was, you know, that was like a vacation because of land warfare because great, I'm a great shot. I'm good on the land because uh, I was a hunter and, uh, you know, I was a country boy. So mm -hmm. I knew about all that stuff. And Mike Martin was in your buds class as well? Yeah, class 50. He rolled back oh, in. Oh, so you rolled into his class. Yeah, yeah. And then, from and, Mike Thornton to Mike Martin. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's good. I never <laughs> thought about that before from one Mike to the other. And Mike uh, Mike and I were swim buddies. I mean, we did all the dives together, everything else. He was a hoot when it came to doing ocean dives because he'd always – get above me and I couldn't, you know, when you're diving, you're looking for your swim buddy to the sides, right? Not above you. And Mike could screw with me all the time and hide up there in the kelp. And I go, well, I just lost my swim buddy. Where the hell is he, right? Well, that was when we were out in uh, Point Loma. Were you guys diving the Emerson rig? Oh, absolutely. You mean, yeah, the one that that bubbled the way everything? Yes. Well, yeah, the, I don't the know. Worst I, I've only ever. heard they called it Green Death. Yes, yes. That's because it was not a good rig. Well, because all of the bags, see, the bags that they had on it were built uh, to keep, you know, the air 
but because of your rubbing on things and operating and everything else, that always get a, a wear pattern in them. So you're always off gassing uh-huh. in those bags. So you always had to charge them. And if you didn't make sure your bags were charged, that's why they called it the green death. <laughs> so yeah, we, 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 uh, we dove those a lot. A lot, but uh, but we made it. We made it through, and then we all went to uh, San Clemente Island, which was another hoot, and had a great, great time out at San Clemente Island, blowing up stuff, shooting stuff. I mean, you know, it's it was, a dream. It's a dream. It's a yeah, dream. Total dream. <laughs> Coming across the beach at night, you know, it was uh, it was definitely definitely a good thing. And then and and once we graduated, but our graduations in those days were certainly not what the graduations are today. Mm-hmm. We were out behind building 401 and they came by and gave us our certificates and goes congratulations you guys you know we all felt 10 foot tall because we graduated buds but at the same time there was no crowds there no nothing (laughs) it was just us so different and you how did you not go to a udt team Uh, i was great at land warfare and i was a great shot so they kind of, that's the way it worked in those days. If you were a good swimmer, if you were a real good swimmer, and you were, were kind of trended towards that, then you would go to UDT. If you were good at land warfare, good at, at blowing up things and, and shooting, then you'd go to SEAL Team. And that's how I got picked to go to SEAL Team 1 because I was much better on land than I was in the water. So... That was the. Um, that's what brought us over there. Mike and I went there. We went through SBI together. And now, you know. when you get to SBI, oh, now there's just one SEAL team on the coast. So obviously, SEAL team one's running the SBI, which is the oh, yeah. the training to get you SEAL the, baking, the, the, basic the actual and, yeah. the actual skills to yes. be a SEAL. Because in buds, you don't learn a lot of right, those. Right. Yeah. And who's running that? The cadre. The cadre. The, the cadre. I mean, we had um, Moki Martin. You know. Yeah. Uh, and he was there, and we had a number of other excellent guys that were had been to Vietnam several times. They were our instructors, the um, and they took us out to our famous location is Nyland. Mm-hmm. You know, when there was nothing there, we lived in. Uh, we had trailers, the old uh, s- streams, uh, silver stream trailers, oh, yeah. stream <laughs> trailers. That's what we lived in with no no windows. It was 120 degrees. You know, we'd get up every morning and have our protein breakfast, which was fruit cocktail out of a can <laughs> because there was nobody cooking anything. And then, we, and then we'd go work in the desert all day and come back in that heat. And then we'd have, uh, we'd have dinner, which was fruit cocktail in a can and kipper snacks, which was another good deal. <laughs> so, and then they had the... Uh, then they had the irrigation ditches up in the, in the desert where mm-hmm. they'd irrigate all the fields. Well, that was our shower because we didn't have any running water. <laughs> so we would fill our we would fill our canteens up to go train and in the desert at the filling station in town, and off we'd go. That was the uh, that would but we had a lot of bullets and that's yeah. all that mattered. Bullets, but the heat was unbearable. I mean, it's unbearable. 120 degrees. So it got us ready basically for Vietnam because when we got to Vietnam, it was kind of like. Shit, this place is cold. <laughs> but so SBI, how long was SBI? SBI was like six weeks. Okay, six weeks, and and that got us up to speed. And then they got us into our platoons, and then. Uh, and so, what what year was this now? This was nineteen sixty nine. Nineteen sixty nine. Yeah. And what platoon did you go into at SEAL Team One? At uh, Foxtrot Platoon. I was a point man of Foxtrot Platoon, Squad 1, and Mikey was a point man of Squad 2. Mike Thornton or Mike Martin? Mike Martin. Mike Martin. You're right. Mike Martin, I mean, Mike Thornton had already been over with oh, another platoon. Because he was in Class 49. Class 49. Yeah, and we, since we were kind of six weeks behind those guys, that's why we rolled. But there was no, we didn't have the time lag they have today about going to war. When you finish SBI, you were going right now. So I remember the day when they go, okay, you guys are deploying. And we went over to uh, North Island Air Station. Did you do any kind of workup as a, pl- as a platoon? A uh, y- couple weeks, you know, a couple so weeks. So you finish SBI, yeah, and then it's into a platoon. You spend and, a few weeks into a, in the platoon. And, platoon, and then off. Off your And going. I guess there wasn't really, because there's so many less SEALs, there was only, what, on the West Coast, there was, what, 100 80. SEALs? 80 SEALs. Yeah. Okay, so everybody's kind of uniformed anyways yeah. because you're all learning from the exact same cadre. That's right. And that's why when, when I 
came back from Vietnam. That's why they put me right into training cell because we had new guys that had to be trained up, and there was no time lag to get that going. Right, so that's what they that's what they were doing. The guys that were really good in the in the field, they would take them and put them right in the to training department and get the guys that are ready to go into it and off they go. So, so how, how long was it? So how long were you in your platoon? You were in Foxtrot platoon for like. A couple months, and then you then yeah. they said, "All right, you're going on deployment." Probably nine. We were we were in there three months prior to deployment, and then we deploy. We'd be over there six months and come back, and then they break the platoon apart, and yeah. off it goes. Was there any? I mean, was there any like this anti-war stuff that did you even think about it? We were all way too busy to <laughs> even think about that. I mean, we we saw it when we got home, you know, because of the because of the anti-war stuff and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff, and you know, and we were too hardened to even care, didn't care. right? Yeah. We didn't care, and uh, so that we just kind of blew right past that. We never got into anyone. I mean, when we got home, there was kind of a demonstration outside of of North Island you know about that kind of thing uh-huh. but we drove right by it yeah. but so it was no no big deal so what was in your so how old are you now right now are you like 19 20 years old yes so you're 20 years old you're going yeah, on your 20. first deployment to vietnam yeah yeah how, i turned 21 over there. what was your what was your thoughts flying over to vietnam <laughs> Well, we had like a, a C-17, which was like a World War II plane that we were flying in, and it seemed like we flew forever. And, you know, and then the cool thing about it is when you left North Island, they give you a box lunch. <laughs> then when you landed in Hawaii, they give you a box lunch. Well, the you know, the box lunch was like an egg, an orange. You had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and then a meat and cheese sandwich <laughs> and some milk. So, so that was your box lunch, and and off you went, man. We went in high style, you know. And we landed at Tonsonude Airport. We we landed there, and they we hung out there for a while. And then the uh, even before we had to fly from Tonsonude down to Bentui because our the special operations office or SEAL team office was at Bentui, so we flew into there. I flew into there because I was like the part of the pre-party to go to mm-hmm. sea float and start setting up for the new platoon and run the first ops and stuff with the uh, with the old platoon and stuff like that. So that was, uh, we flew from there. The rest of the guys stayed in the Victoria Hotel, you know, in uh, in Saigon at the time. And we took off and flew down to uh, Bentui, got ready to catch a bird and go on down to sea float. And were you pretty much just completely amped to go and get some? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> We all are. Yeah. I mean, hey, yeah. but that's a way. That's who we are, yeah. right? Yeah, we wanted to get with it. We wanted to get with the program and and get there as soon as possible. We did our breaking up. You know, we what made, about older guys that were on there? Who who in your platoon had been on like three, four, or five deployments already? Well, uh, the chief uh, that we had, Chief Jones, had been on it. He'd been on a, a couple of deployments. Uh, my radioman, Lee Pittman, who had been there. We had another guy, Al Yutz, who was our rear security guy. You know, and they're all good guys, all good guys. Uh, and what was their attitude like going back? Hey, let's Same rock. Thing. Let's, let's rock. Yeah, let's rock. <laughs> so legit. <laughs> Lee Pittman was my was was the best. He was the best radio man you could ever want, right? He was in there calling them and just said, hey, get over here, you know. But they were all, you know. I think I think probably the biggest guy, the gun shy one was the chief he he just had seen a lot of war and i don't think that he really he knew he had to be there because he was the chief right Mm -hmm. but some of the shit that we got into you know he just um it was time for him to go home Mm -hmm. right and so we did we sent him home because when the shit we got into man i mean one night when we got ambushed on the damn doy and and mike probably told you this but we were going in and i had um i was going in on a sampan we had like four sampans on the bow of the of the seal light support craft and uh i was asleep in the uh in the sampan right we hit this canal called the damn doy something woke me up i think it's a guy upstairs you know I, the lord was going kirby it's time for you to wake up so I woke up and I go, holy shit. And I jump, I start to jump in the boat and a B-40 rocket blows the bow of the boat off. I roll and come up right behind, right, I'm holding on to the 50 caliber machine gun. We're right in the middle of the kill zone of an ambush. Everything we learned, right? If you're in a kill zone, blast your way out of mm-hmm. it. So that 50 swung around and it just started blasting. 
and I had a couple of guys on the floor, which the chief was one of them, and they were linking that 50 cal ammo, and that 50 cal was going for everything it was worth, man. People on the on the banks, guys were shooting flares, and every time I saw a guy, the 50 caliber took them out. So it was like we were t- doing damage. But by then, the first boat that Mike was on, Miss Mike Martin, they had called in the sea wolves. So the sea wolves were scrambling. Here these guys come flying over, miniguns blaring. The door gunners have got their white BVDs on and flak jackets. They never even took time to get dressed. And they're blowing the shit out of this place over there, right? So by the time we got all that settled, the the um, I had had bullet holes through my clothes that had burned my skin, but no through and through. Everybody, uh, the boat was, we had to scrap the boat because it had so many bullet holes in it. It was unbelievable. Mike's boat, the medium support, had to tow us a line, and then we had to make a circle and come back out of the dam. Door. Hell of a firefight. Hell of a firefight. Went on for a long, long time. And the, um, and when we got back to sea float, you know, the, the boat uh, that I was in was almost ready to sink, right? So it was it was very well destroyed, but... Nobody got shot. Nobody got killed. I got burn marks. That was the biggest. That was the biggest deal. But the um, that was a wild time. And the and the coxswain, whose name was uh, Willie Willi- Williams, that guy was uh, he was an older guy, right? And every time he'd go out with us, he needed to take a shot of whiskey, just just to keep himself Get sane. Get the edge off. <laughs> <laughs> take the edge off. And, and he was like going ah. <laughs> yeah, he was. That was one crazy night for Willie. But we all made it home safe, you know, and ready for the next day. So, so when you got there, what was the what was the primary, what was the mission that you guys were tasked with doing? What were you guys doing? Well, we were, you know, when we got there, uh, Admiral Zumwalt had towed a bunch of barges up, right? 13 mm-hmm. barges. We called it Sea Float. You can go online and look at it. It's a bunch of, of barges that supported all of the riverine boats and all of the air squadrons in South Vietnam. So it set, they anchored it right in the middle of the San Kulan River with these giant anchors, right? So it was um, probably about, I don't know, 100 yards, you know, on each side of it on mm-hmm. the riverbanks until the tides, you know, went when the tides changed over there because they were a 14-foot tide change. Then you'd have mud banks and stuff like that. So it worked out perfectly. The problem with it, and that's where we were all stationed. The problem with it was that the zappers would use the current and tie explosives on a line, let the explosives float down with the current and hook around your anchor chain, and then these explosives would come into the side of sea float and try to blow you up. So all of the guards that were posted 24-7 at the thing would have to watch out for that and shoot it out. So in the middle of the night when you're trying to get sleep and all of a sudden this big <laughs> charge blows up, and you go, oh, cool. <laughs> well, that one didn't get us. And so that was the uh, that was life on sea float. I mean, every every. And that's night, where your birthing was and everything? Everything, everything. Yeah, birthing, showers, food, everything. That's where our offices were at and all that kind of stuff. So it was uh, it was an experiment to do that, uh, very Was that successful. your full deployment on that thing? Yes, well, except when I was working Phoenix program. If I was working Phoenix program, then I would go to different locations, right? But they, um, but we usually would launch off of there, and some of the Phoenix stuff we would do were two-man sampan ops, where myself, Leon Roush, rest his soul, him and I would get in a sampan and take a KCS scout with us, and we would paddle 10 clicks into bad guy country and snatch this guy out of his hooch and bring him back because he's a, was a bad guy. Like a high-level VC? Yeah, high-level VC. Where would that intel come from? Uh, from the Kid Carson Scouts, from Navy Intelligence, you know, from uh, from a lot of different areas, and we would bring it all in because we sent a lot. We did a lot of own our own intelligence gathering in the southern region down there. Explain Nothing the about. Phoenix program for people that don't know what it is. Well, the Phoenix program was di- designed by the agency and probably several other people. And what it was was to root out the the bad guys in villages that were working kind of like double agents that were working for the South Vietnamese government, also working for the Viet Cong. So what we relied on, what the Phoenix program relied on was intel from the locals that this guy was a double agent. And then when we got that, then we would send teams in to snatch the guy 
and bring them out and do further interrogation on them by not only us but by other groups you know mm -hmm. and that worked it worked well until the bad guys started fingering good guys and now the intelligence was all mixed up so you know in the beginning of it it worked fantastic because we got a lot of uh, a lot of bad guys you know basically out of the jungle but then the bad it was guys like psychological operations too because totally. these guys who thought that they were safe and thought they could get away with it all of a sudden they disappear in the middle of the night absolutely absolutely and put the fear of god into them that's right that's what the men in the green faces did was make them disappear and you were running two man operations oh yeah, oh, yeah. getting in a getting in a sampan and you were paddling how how far would you guys paddle i think the farthest we ever the deepest we ever went was probably 10 clicks from a safe zone would you into what would you carry for radio where would you carry your radio we carry regular radio prick 25 prick, tw prick yeah. 25 yeah yeah and i carried i carried a but you're uh, dressed like a vietnamese guy oh, absolutely black pajamas you know the but look. it's nighttime so they can't see that you're a white boy from missouri that's right. that's, <laughs> that's exactly right that's exactly right probably the hairiest op that i tell everybody about this op because leon and i went on on this op and we captured this high level vc and we're paddling back out so hold right? on, let's if it's, if it's a good one let's talk about it so this is phoenix program operation Phoenix program operation. And you get intel on a bad guy. Right. They tell you, okay. Now, how detailed was the intelligence that would, you would get? Would they say, okay, here's the village. Would you get overhead imagery of that village? No, not in those days. So you just would look at a map? We would look at a map. We would talk with our KCS. And the KCS were, were kind of guys that we paid on our side to that knew the local area because we had captured them, but we had switched them over to our side we were paying them we also had a village with their family that we supported okay and it so we made sure that they weren't going to go to the other side because their family was uh, visiting us right. right so that was the whole thing so they would help us decide exactly where this we're at and they were good guys and it, for the most part they were wonderful wonderful so, operators so you'd be looking at you you'd, okay there's a village at this grid coordinate right. or whatever You'd look at it, you'd do a map study looking at the river. Sure. And you think, okay, when this river turns to whatever, 280 degrees, then we have to go another 200 meters, right. and the village will be on the left side of the, the Ab bank. Absolutely. And then work the tides, because remember, the tides are 14 feet. So <sighs> you've got to move with the tides. There's nothing moving against the tide. You can move at ebb, uh -huh. but you gotta you got to move with the flow. Would you try and time it so you were going in with the tide and coming out with the tide? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was key. Yeah, and if you didn't do that, you're kind of screwed. <laughs> yes. Well, you were very slow one way or the other. <laughs> and then you're going into a little, like this is just your stereotypical Vietnamese village. Oh, absolutely. With a bunch of little hooches set up. Yep. And you would know, hey, third hooch from the water on the right-hand side, it's got a whatever, a freaking. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's how we would target it. And then, okay, so you go up, you paddle. You're tracking. Are you using any night vision at all? No. Remember, Are you trying to do it with moon, with half moon, with starlight? Did you want it completely dark? What did you want? All, what was ideal? All the half moon would have been ideal. But you and that's what we would that. have. But you, you don't always get that. So that was the whole thing. So that was a roll of the dice sometimes, depending on what the moon coverage was at you know, and tides, yeah. you know, what was going. So you always had to work those two, especially with a two-man team. Two-man team, you don't have a whole lot there. I mean, you got everybody on standby. What are you carrying for a weapon? Stoner, man. <laughs> Come on. I didn't go anywhere without Betsy. She was, she was with me all the time. She was a great equalizer. How you know? many rounds would you carry? A thousand. And it, and what like two canteens of water and a K bar and you're good maybe some grenades maybe one canteen of water a K bar a medical kit and four grenades uh -huh. and I was good that that was my black pajama outfit <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so a body armor body armor was a t shirt with a bull, bullseye <laughs> painted on it <laughs> and you're in black pajamas and so you get so you paddle up. And then you, do you just beach the boat? Yeah, coast right in. Coast, coast right, right in. in. It's quiet. Right. 
Is there any other activity on the water at night? And if there is, isn't it other VC activity? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I'll I'll tell you a story about coming out of one of the villages where there were, you know, I mean, they're moving the same way you're moving. They're moving with tides and everything else. If right? they're moving at night, are they VC? Yes. Okay. Yep. Only uh, people out there that were friendly were us, and the, and the the philosophy goes everything on this op, everything, everybody that's on this op's coming home safe. Everything else is not, mm -hmm. right? So that's what it was. So we slid into a village one night. So we slide in, we take the people we want, knock them out, throw them in the bottom of the What'd boat. you do to knock them out? Uh, hit them with the hammer, hit them with the whatever. Just standard operating procedure. Carry the slapper, you know? <laughs> the slapper always works, man. Slapper on the jaw, you'll knock a guy out Did you out carry right any now. suppressed weapons? Um, I did. 22s. Uh -huh. That's all we had in those days. We didn't have any the little hush hours. puppies. Yeah, yeah. And we did those mostly for dogs that mm -hmm. were and geese that were, you know, that were put out there to act as shooting headshot on a geese. That's impressive. Sorry. Well, yeah, it is. But <laughs> you, you usually shot them in the fat body. <laughs> With the twenty two with the twenty two long they go, What 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 what, what was that? <laughs> but the um, but the stoner one night were coming out. We met some V C going in. We were just kinda laying up waiting for the tide to change. And we were laying in the weeds, right? And a V C sampan came by and uh, I put my stoner up, had my stoner pointed at him, following on the sand pans, and he reaches out to knock all the weeds away and touches the cold steel. Well, his eyes were very big at that moment, but they weren't big for very long. <laughs> so we eliminated those boys and kept on moving. <laughs> yeah. It's so once you get in a contact like that, now everybody knows you're there. Everybody, scram everything gets scrambled, everything. Okay, so now you're scrambling the sea wolves. Oh, absolutely. And they'd come out at night to try and help you? Oh, yeah. They'd we had, we had a guy from, we had a Dennis Rowley on here from, he was a sea wolf pilot. Oh, good. And he just was just awesome. Oh, yeah. Awesome talking oh, to yeah, him. Yeah. They didn't care about anything. Oh. They were going. They were going. If you guys called them, they were going 100%. They were oh, going. Oh, yeah. They're, they were full on. And if you haven't seen their new video, yep. you got to see it. We, right? we, we, we put out the word Scramble the Sea Wolves. Yeah, yeah, Scramble the Sea Wolves. You got to do it. It's a great, great film, man. Talks about those guys, and you can't say enough about those guys. They're coming now to our our Vietnam, you know, um, parties, get togethers that we have because they were so vital to our survival, you know. I mean, yeah. They saved our ass way more. Than we can even count. Yeah, cr yeah. crazy. He told, crazy. A story. he told a story. They were, they they stayed on station so long. They he goes, look, we're gonna run out of fuel. Oh That's well, right. they run out of fuel. They land in the middle of a rice paddy. Yep. and they're using ammo cans to to transport to fuel, fuel from one. <laughs> the, those, <laughs> Total they, insanity. They they were all garage mechanics. Those guys were unbelievable. I mean, I was a hot rod mechanic, so I understood the mechanism. But what they did to get those birds airborne in the beginning was phenomenal. I mean, they took pieces and parts and pieces and parts and did it. And to see them do that, and then, you know, as the war carried on, people at the Army actually started copying what they were doing. They're going, how, how come those guys do that and we can't do that, right? So now there's mini guns on way more mm -hmm. aircraft than they ever had before, and that was because the Sea Wolves were the ones that started it. And they put their rocket pods on there. I mean, hey, man, you know, it was all good. It was all good. So yeah. you, you whack this feces that touches the barrel of your weapon in the, of the dark. Stunner. Yeah, yeah. You kill him. Now it's on. It's on. Because it's been completely silent the whole night. Whole whole night. And all of a sudden there's a, a burst of five, five, six rounds, and now everyone's awake. Yep. So now you, do you get on the radio? Oh, and, yeah. And you got to go, hey, we just, we're in contact the VC, the, our, our KCS is paddling like a wild man. <laughs> Leon is on the radio, and I got the stoner out of the front of the, of the sandpan, and we're going. How, we're far, going. how far away are you from we were getting picked up? We were probably like three, four clicks inside VC country, so that's how we had to go 4,000 yards to get off. I mean, everybody knew where we were at, so the launch was good. It was hairy to say this. The thing. good thing is they don't have night vision. That was a good thing. 
how, how we good, didn't have we didn't have night vision either. Uh, yeah, but I mean, at that point, I'd take that trade because I don't want them to have night vision on a river. It's a night. It's scary. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I've been on the river. It's like mm, in a combat zone, you feel real naked. When, oh, I'm, if the enemy possibly has night vision, even when they don't have night vision. Well, depending you're, on the mood. Your whole in, your whole in, instinctive reaction is is heightened, right? The hair on the back of your neck, everything's going right because you know they they are feeling exactly the same thing you're feeling like they're going holy shit man where's this person at because they don't know exactly Mm -hmm. where you're at all they heard was a burst so they're coming and they're cautious and you're moving as fast as you can right so that was the whole thing we knock on wood the lord was with us that night and we got home safe right and so what's your what's your extract point do you get do you meet a uh in the main canal the main canal. The main canal, we'll, and there's, yeah. a, there's a boat there's, of some yeah. kind? Yeah, yeah. What kind of boats were you guys using? At the MSC, we had light seal support craft, which okay. was the one that we got ambushed in. We had medium seal support craft, which were aluminum boats that had a step on the back of them, had uh, two twin uh, 427 Chevy motors in them with Holley carburetors. We I put the Holley carburetors <laughs> on. So, and these things, I mean, they were fast, man. They would do 50 miles an hour plus on those rivers. So... If once you got them on step, get out of the way. There wasn't anything stopping. And then we had swift boats and we had PBRs. Then we had the big junks that were down at sea float and everything else. So there was there was more than enough um, coverage to pick us up once we were on the big river. So you're paddling out. Do you stay close to the edge of the river so oh, yeah. you're in the dark? Oh, sure. Shadows, man. So you edge. try and stay in the shadows? Don't get, yeah, don't get in a hurry when, and rush something, right? Take your time. I mean, you just, you ch- you had a burst. Nobody knows what mm-hmm. that was, but they know there's something, right? Because yeah. there's not And if you had one anything. burst, it's hard for them to even triangulate by sound where oh, it totally. was. Yes, totally. Is totally. that true in the jungle too? Like in the city, you, it was hard to, really hard to tell where a bur- one burst, it would be hard to tell where it came from. Same, same. Because you, you have the same situation. It's, that sound is bouncing off of mm-hmm. everything. So, you know, that's why they have, they invented the... Um, when we were over in Bosnia, you know, the Brits had the triangulation yeah. thing where when a mortar would go off, they could triangulate right where the noise was at. Yeah. And then we could drop stuff right on that. That was an excellent thing. We didn't have that in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. We're kind of going, I think it's over there. Yeah, yeah. No, maybe over there. Right. And as soon as you're, I mean, you scramble out of the immediate area, but you get 200 meters away and then it's like, okay, let's get quiet. Yep, let's yep. pull to the edge. Same, th- same thing as you do as an insertion. Yeah. Right. You move off that noisy spot, you move in, you set, you wait. Is anything moving? Is anything coming at us? No, it's not. Okay, let's move, right? Get going. That's where the word black came from. When you mm-hmm. go black, go black. That came from <laughs> guess who? <laughs> <laughs> that was a Vietnam thing. Go black. Nobody knows what that word means, only you, uh-huh. right? So when you're sh- all the shit's going, everything else is going, go black. Boom. Now, where does everybody? Nobody knows where it's all coming from. They suspect it, but they don't know. And are they brave enough to stick their face out there to find out? Not really. <laughs> so that was that was uh, that was one of many. I mean, so, we had. So, so is that the op? I cut you off, and then we kind of ran off on another story. Is that the one you said? This is a story I always tell. It was Phoenix program. It was in a village. Oh, one of, one of many. Okay, yes, yeah, one of many. So that's the one. Yeah, where, where you had that guy. You had that contact. Well, we had, range. And then I'll go to another one that was down south when we uh, inserted because we had some VC. We had intelligence. The VC was coming up south. We had done all the sensor planning to in the jungles to make sure we could pick up movement in the jungles and stuff like that. And we got movement way down deep, but we had to go in and set. So Al- Alpha Platoon of uh, Foxtrot, we went down to set up on a river that we thought – they were going to be coming across. So we moved in late in the evening. So you're setting up an ambush. We're setting up an ambush. And it's site. an ambush on a river. On a river. And right? this is straight up the same thing that you guys taught us when Absolute. I got into the team. Did Claymore, you put out claymores? The same thing. <laughs> it's ex- absolutely the same thing. Claymores on each flank, claymore in the rear. Let's watch, see what happens, right? So I'm on the left flank, right? I run my claymore out, come back in, I'm setting right? And all of a sudden I hear movement, right? So I'm watching the tides. The tides are are going down and I see this um, bridge start bubbling up from the water. 
so they have a hidden bridge in it. So I see that. The only saving grace is we're on high ground, they're on low ground. I see all these guys, there's like 80 guys down there that are trying to come across that bridge to do a ambush on sea float on the San Culan River. So I let the first guy, right? I tell the O, get the black ponies and the sea wolves in the air. So he scrambles those guys, right? So this guy comes walking across, and it's a point element. Come What's right the there. range from you? Uh, probably when I initiate, probably five feet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he's got to walk up like this, up the bridge, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm right here. So the old stoner comes over, and I go, whoa, and we light him up, all right? Grenades, boom, 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 light him up. And overhead, OV-10s. Right? And one of the pilots lives right here in town. We call him. We throw the, uh, we had um, uh, Tierra, which was kind of the early stages of Kim Light juice that we could throw in the water that marked our uh, line. Okay. So we threw that in the water, marked our line, and the OV 10s come flying out of the sky. And they're coming from like 3,000 feet directly at the ground, letting loose the zoomy rockets going wham, 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 wham. And they're getting kind of close. And I'm going, blow the claymores and get the hell out of here. So we're blowing the claymores and we're getting the hell out of there, right? And these guys are just tearing it up across the river. And so we're taking off and all of a sudden we hear this, and I go, shit, what is that? Run! <laughs> so so we're taking off. Well, what it was was our, our lieutenant had just pulled his life jacket just enough in the frenzy oh. to where the CO2 cartridge was, was, like was, was weeping. I'm going, get away from him. He's going to blow. <laughs> so we're hauling ass. We're hauling ass back up the canal. It was what a night that was. Holy shit, man. And then we sent down a um, – a group of Arvins the next morning to check it out, and they there was like eighty dead bodies down there. So it was wild. So an op like that, what what? How did you guys insert? We inserted on boat up the river where the river so turned. So up We'd the river, how far how far away would you guys probably, patrol? Probably probably click. Okay, so pretty close. Yeah. And you patrolling? What are you wearing? You wearing? Are you wearing blue jeans? I didn't wear blue jeans that night. I did wear blue jeans, but that night I didn't wear blue jeans. How about but, how about barefoot? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Jim Bird is the only one that does barefoot. <laughs> the, uh, no, I wore my boots, and I'm glad I wore my boots. <laughs> yeah, that, that always seemed crazy to me, but I know there's guys that did it. Oh, man, I know. So I, and I know guys that did it too, but I, pff, hey, when I'm moving, I'm moving way too fast to worry about stepping on something, right? Yeah, because uh, that was a busy night. And that so for a night like that, since you're not wearing the black pajamas, you're wearing web gear, you got yeah. your stoner, you're still carrying a thousand rounds? A thousand rounds. Offensive operation, are you bringing more grenades? Uh, we would have, probably, you know, and smoke. I mean, since I was a point man, I would, mm-hmm. I would have carried whatever the red or the green smoke, and the radio men usually carry the red smoke. If we need to mark something, if we need to mark an LZ, they would have it. Somebody else would have yellow and purple, you know, out through the, out through the squad. And then in the squad, how many 60s would you have in the squad? Uh, two. Two sixties, and then would the rear security be carrying a stone or two? You bet. And nothing would, like far superiority. Yeah. Okay. So any, what about would you would be? So there'd be two stoners and two sixties. Two stoners, two sixties, and so, then, sometimes three stoners and two sixties. The, uh, the uh, lieutenant would carry um, M sixteen, uh-huh. right? AOIC would probably carry, and they would probably have uh, you know M seventy nine. M seventy nines are have a 203 underneath of it uh-huh. you know that's probably what would would have went on and were you guys in in seven or eight man squads we were in eight <laughs> yeah yeah eight 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 men squads right so it was yeah that was uh, how long would you guys a- plan for these missions for Oh, that's, you know, I mean, we had our own intel. So, I mean, when we get something, we could put together an op in a couple hours mm-hmm. and ready to go. Because, you know, just as, as every SEAL knows, you know, once the uh, you get there and you get the routine down, everybody knows what their job is. That's what makes us what we are. And so we can put together an op very, mm-hmm. very quickly, mm-hmm. you know. And, um, you know, just in, in Germany, when I was working in Germany, you know, N plus two, 
That's what it meant, man. Mm -hmm. N plus two. Mm -hmm. When you get the call, you got two hours to get the airport, get on that airplane, and get going. And that happened more than I want to. Mm -hmm. We can shift gears, but the uh, that was that was the Vietnam War, and mm -hmm. then I came back. And um, so, what, what, just hold on, the Vietnam War. How? What was your op tempo like? Like, how often were you guys working? We ran probably in that six month period of time well over a hundred ops. So, I mean, there were days when. Um, there would be three ops a day, you know, other days where there's two ops, one op. Did you do any of those parakeet ops flying in the daytime, like just pouncing on a village or something? Sure, sure, we did that. And I'll tell you a good story about that. We we did one of those when, because I was a point man, I was a guy that hung out the door and located the village, right? Because we didn't have GPS in those mm -hmm. days. So I was hanging out the door and I'd find the village where the bad guys were at and I'd tell the birds set down. So we're flying down this canal. I mean, we're doing every maneuver. We're following each bend in, in that canal. I'm hanging out the door and I go, that's the village right there. So he flares, we jump out, hit it. We're in a skirmish line. We start taking fire from the village. Not long or close behind us are, are the sea wolves. So we get in the skirmish line, we start moving on this village, right? And taking taking all the bad guys down to this village, and we call in the sea wolves. Well, the sea wolves come in probably ten feet over our head with the mini guns and just start breaking the village. Right. Needless to say, we look like wild men running at the village, and that was because all the hot brass coming out of the mini guns were going down the back of our necks, and we were going help us. <laughs> so I was going to kill anybody that was in front of me. I didn't care who it was. <laughs> we all got back. We all got back to sea float, and we, all of us had like Burns. 20 burn marks on our back where the hot brass had fallen out of that minigun. I went, that's probably the last time I'm going to do that. <laughs> but it wasn't. But it wasn't. But it worked out. That worked out fantastic. And that was like the same what you're calling parakeet. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Any kind of ops, stay behind ambushes, all that kind of stuff. We did all that. We incorporated all that in our tactics how often would you guys get contact with the enemy on an op so if you did a hundred operations how we, often would you guys get contacted with the enemy you know I want to say 70% of the time because we did most of our own intelligence mm -hmm. so we were always uh, involved in contact you know it wasn't there were a few times where we walked and walked and dry uh, hole and or whatever dry no hole, one yeah, shows yeah. up wasn't wasn't where it was supposed to be but the majority of the time we had contact which was which kept us all kind of you know jazzed and ready to go yeah. pumped that was the whole thing but it kept it real because we were all we knew when we'd go out we were going to have contact so you better have your shit in one bag did, uh, how how did you guys do for taking casualties? Uh, well, you know, everybody in Foxtrot Platoon, except for um, one of our officers, who <laughs> I have to laugh because <laughs> Mike Martin pointed out a booby trap to him, and he turned around to tell somebody about the booby trap and walked into the booby trap, and Oof. it put some BBs in his butt. So he so he was a casualty. <laughs> so we had to we had to fly him back to a sea float. And get the get the holes in his ass patched up, but <laughs> but other than that, uh, everybody I think I mean we all got hit, mm -hmm. but nobody got hit so badly that they had to um, they had to be medevaced off. Now our group when we were there is when we had the biggest loss of life in uh, in Vietnam when the Hilo went down mm -hmm. that we lost five guys. I, we got off of that bird and that bird that operation was an operation that we had just come off of because we had we went after a Russian advisor to the um, to the Viet Cong. We had him in a um, in a village. He was able to run out of that village and, and run into the forest, you know, um, that was at the end of a, a rice paddy, so we decided to go after that. But going after that, we got met with like 500 VC because they had a whole company size element down there so we kind of got it handed to us in a bit but nobody nobody lost their lives mm -hmm. we were able to you guys get break back contact? get back break contact get on our birds and get home but the bird took some took some hits 
right? So when it landed at Seaflow, we told them, shut it down, let's take a look at it. The Army pilot said, no, no, I, all my gauges are good, it's good, and everything else. Well, our five guys, Jack Donnelly and Toby Thomas and Sparks and Ritter and Gore, got on the bird to go up to Bentui. And then like a thousand yards out from Bentui, the bird spun its rotors and inverted. And the, and the guys, all of them were skydivers, so they all left the bird, you know, and tracking across the sky. But what happened is they, some from what I know, is they hit the hit the uh, rice paddies and stuck in the mud and drowned in the in the rice paddy. They couldn't get themselves loose from the uh, from the mud. So that was a that was a crime. We all cried about that. It was they were all great great team guys. That was a bad day bad day in our lives. What did they do with that platoon? Um, just backfilled it, uh-huh. backfilled it, you know, and the um, and then we all kept working because when we got to Sea Float, there was one platoon. Foxtrot was there. When we left, there because there was so much action, we had four platoons at at there trying to cover down on on everything that was going on, right? So it was a it was a very active active place. Another good op I'll tell you about that was a um, Square Bay, Square Bay op, which was a location right up from the entrance of the San Coulon River. And it was at night. The VC would run um, supply uh, trains down across Square Bay in sampans and deliver it to the VC, which were down south of us, uh, that we were always hitting. So we found this out, so we decided to set up an op on on Square Bay, so I, we built a, um, I built a twin sixty mount for the Boston Whaler, which we had silent running, you know, twenty fives on, and we took that up to Square Bay, and we parked it in a little cove up there, and just waited. That night we had night vision, our great big night vision mm-hmm. glass, and we're watching these sampans as they're coming across Square Bay, and there was like twenty five of them. And we said, wow, this is the wild, wild west. So we got on the boats. The boat driver was there, got on the 60s, and we hit it. And we hit it because the square bay, very shallow, probably 10 foot of water. Mm-hmm. And we come across there blazing them 60s and all those guys in that in that whole sampan psh, sticking out like dog's balls. <laughs> so we just let them have it. Let them have it. With one Boston Whaler. One Boston with Whaler. With 60s. Twin, twin 60s, 60s oh, mounted yeah. on it. Well, yeah. And there's how many sampans? There's, uh, I think there was like 40, right? <laughs> so, I mean, we had other team guys in the boats with, yeah. with stoners and stuff, right? Yeah. So we hit these guys, devastate them, devastate them, and now we got now we got 40 sampans full of fish, rice, you know, guns, everything that the bad guys need down south. They, we waited for daylight, which was probably about 45 minutes, so we just let them set there, right, waiting for any guys that kind of pool blood that wanted to get up and shoot again. So we just set. Then we then we approached once it started breaking daylight, right? So the only person that was alive was this old woman that was chewing beech nut, <laughs> had, had like three teeth going, nye, 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 nye. So, we, so we made her drive. <laughs> So, so she drove all the sampans back to sea float. It was wild. I know, I know. There's helos because there's helos over the top of us. Somebody was taking a picture of that, but it was it was a magnificent thing, right? And bringing all these sampans back to uh, sea float, and then we gave them to, we distributed them to the village that we had started, which was upriver. We had Got captured it. so many people at sea float that we started a village upriver probably about probably about a half a mile from sea float mm-hmm. and we just that was our village right so we anything we would recover or anything else from the Viet Cong we would give to the village it was a fishing village right started with like five people by the time we left country it was like 1500 people who were these people they were just innocent fishermen and you know and innocent citizens that had gotten caught up in the Got war it. right and they were trying to get out of the war zone so we moved them up there great fishing where it was at and the um, and you know they would go to market you know, which was up in Vung Tau, and not Vung Tau, but uh, Bentui, and, and sell their fish and all that kind of stuff. So they were just trying to make a living. 
So we would take everything to those guys. So that day they got all kinds of fish and brand new sampans and everything else. They loved us. I love those Americans. So it was very, that was very cool. Very, very cool. The old lady, we took the old lady up there too and said, you have a new home now. She just kept going. (laughs) <laughs> chewing her beech nut <laughs> crazy crazy man but that was one that was one crazy op that made the history books so it was uh it was good but yeah we all got home safe which was a blessing you know except for our five guys we lost they lost their lives and uh you know and and then we had um the mighty mo got got ambushed when it went down south we lost uh mikey got hit then should have got a purple heart didn't um Wogslin um, got hit in the eye with a piece of uh, shrap metal. And what lost. happened with that? What was the? Well, the the Mighty Mo was a big Mike boat. You know, it had all kinds of armor on it and everything mm-hmm. else. And what they were doing, which they shouldn't have done, they were trying to punch a way through a canal down to VC country. Well, the VC had grenades and had mines and everything else on it. So when the boat would go down there, it get would catch on cables, right, and then snag their props so they became immobile. Mm-hmm. So they were setting ducks when all these mines started going off and they got hit from mm-hmm. all sides by the VC. So the VC really shot the boat up. Again, sea wolves got us out of there. Mm-hmm. Came in, black ponies got us out of there. We had to go pull the boat out, but the guys that were on the boat, you know, were inside, and the rockets were going inside, and the hot core was bouncing all over the place. So we lost, I think, two guys that day, and Wogsland got his eye put out, and then a, a lot of other people got shrap metal wounds and stuff like that off of the off of the mighty mo. But that was not not a good day, and it um, it probably shouldn't have happened, but it did, right? So. A lot going on when you're uh, out there pushing. How'd you decide when your last op was going to be? Um, gosh, you know, I I can't answer that question because we were working so hard, you know. And everybody goes, "Okay, we're gonna we're not we're gonna stop operating two weeks, right, mm-hmm. before we take off." Well, that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. We just operated up. I know I I know that when I I got home off a of op, I got my gear. Uh, and put it on a helo and flew off. That's mm-hmm. when my last day was. So, and I know the rest of the guys were probably very close to the same. You know, because yeah. I, I was one of the last guys to take off. Uh, we did the turnover op with the new platoon coming in. You know, and that's when we moved off of um, we moved off of um, of sea float and moved into solid anchor because they had built a base over mm-hmm. on we had you know, stabilize the situation enough where the CBs could come in and build the base, you know, um, over on the shore. I always felt like it was a jinx to say, okay, this is our last stop. Oh, yeah. I, I never said that. No. I just, we just kept going, and then one day it was like, guess what, we're going to go home, so we can't do any more. So That's right. That last stop that we just did, that was our last stop. That's exa- And I feel exactly the same way. <laughs> I felt Don't like it was, jinx it and go, okay, yeah. you know. No, and, you know, because our world, it's push, push, push. I mean, we're all jacked up to do everything we can, and you want to do that. I mean, the time to sleep is on your way home. I know I came off of uh, one of the Africa ops uh, that we did down in Sierra Leone, right? And uh, we had saved probably 3,000 people you know, in that particular thing and got them back safe and stuff. And when I jumped on that C-140 fun to come home, and I looked at all the guys that were there with us, I go, man, this hero shit is really hard. <laughs> and, I, and I went to sleep, man. I went, see you later. <laughs> I was gone until we landed in Stuttgart, Germany. Yeah, it was wild. It was wild. But Vietnam was a great, and it's just what you said earlier, Vietnam was a huge learning ground, a huge proving ground for SEAL Team. If we would not have had had Vietnam, we would not be where we're at today. It's close. that simple. It's that simple. And, and, you know, the guys, the personalities, they came from all walks of life, all walks of life. And, and we have that same thing today. At Naval Special Warfare. I mean, I see it in every young man that I see it. Every one of them has got a different personality, but the fire in their gut and the fire in their eyes is there. And they want to do the job, and they want to do it the best they possibly can. 
right, with all the other crap that's going on. I mean, you got to give it to the men, the men. And we're so fortunate to have the quality of men, both officers and enlisted, that we have in Naval Special Warfare because they're professional. They get the job done. Every now and then they drop the ball, but for the most part, yeah. they get it done. Yeah. So, so you come home from Vietnam. I, I come home from Vietnam. I, I get on my Harley, and I uh, <laughs> sounds like a plan right there. <laughs> it was. It was a plan. It was a plan. I uh, well, I had a chopper shop, so I came home. I had a chopper shop before I left the, to uh, go to Vietnam, and and I had still had the chopper shop somewhere when in I got San back. Diego. Yeah, in, in Imperial Beach. Oh, okay, I be. So Good I uh, so I built I built a bike. I built Mike's first bike. Mike took off and went back to Ohio. I said, you know what? I'm going to build a bike and I'm going to go for a ride. So I built a bike, tour, toured around the United States, met Americans again, which was a real eye opener because you know a lot of like today a lot of guys have a lot of mental problems adjusting from the war and stuff like that. I used to travel around the country to adjust myself. Mm-hmm. Right? I didn't have a lot of money. I had a great Harley and I would I'd stop I'd work get a job for a day or two get some gas money get some food money put it in the tank and I'd hit it again and I I made it around the country and enjoyed the hell out of it. Are you on leave at this point? No no out of the Navy. Oh so this is so you came home yeah what'd you do just when you got home? When I ju- well, when I just got home, just then got I, home from I, Vietnam. I went back to the training cell. I was I was on active duty for another two years. Okay. After I got home, were right? you planning to get out when you got home? Were you like, okay, uh, well, when Vietnam ended? I, you know, I don't, I didn't know. I was there for, a, you know, and the whole thing was, I got out. I was out for like ninety days, did this trip around the country, and then came back and got back on active duty. You know. <laughs> And and I said, well, you know, it's the only thing I know and it's the only thing I love, so I'll do that. And then I got off of active duty cleanly and went into the reserves in 75. And in 75, that's when we started the SEAL Reserve Unit mm-hmm. in, in San Diego and also on the west uh, East Coast. And so I was in the reserve unit, um, you know, as a sec- third class, second class petty officer, made first class in the reserves. And then— And in, what was your civilian job at this point? I had a couple civilian jobs. I had a uh, I had a boiler shop that worked and did uh, Navy repair ships over at the 32nd Street, uh, Long Beach, and then I'd go up to Swan Island and do stuff up there because I repaired boilers uh, because it was easy mechanical stuff, machinery stuff. Um, and so I did that, had a company of probably about 15 guys. We did that for a while. Then I had got another company that did it, and uh, that grew to about 90 people. You know, and then I got rid of both those. I sold those, and then a friend of mine came to me and wanted to um, start another company with the. Um, um, it's called the Takeoff and Estimating System. The company was called Texonics, and uh, and we came up with and devised a system where if you put a um, a set of building plans on site on the top of a digitizing board. We had a guy that wrote the algorithm that would could tell you if you touch that stylus in two different points, it would give you the dimension of that eight foot wall, mm-hmm. tell you all the pieces that you needed to build that, tell you what your labor costs would be and everything else. So we sold about 5,000 of those systems t- uh, across the world. And, uh, and we sold that company to a group of Canadian guys. And that's when I, uh, went to uh, reserves in 1990 and they said, hey, we need some volunteers to come back for Desert Storm, Desert Shield. And I went, I think that's me. <laughs> so so that's when I re-engaged. That's when I re-engaged with- So you uh, came back on back. active duty at that point? At, yeah, but you had spent that whole time in the reserves? At the 15 years I'd spent in the reserves. Which is one weekend a month, two weeks yeah, in the summer or something we, like that? Weekend in a month, yeah. Weekend a month and uh, two weeks during the reserves, and we we were very creative about that. We you know we would do uh, cold water training in the Colorado River and a big raft. Yeah, that was good. And then we do cold weather training and um, and <laughs> mammoth or something. And mammoth, yes, yes. <laughs> trying trying to get down the hill as fast as you possibly could. Yes, it was hell, but somebody had to do it. So. But we always got to shoot and we got to blow up things, yeah. keep our quals up. We got the jump, which is which was best better in the reserves than it was on active duty because you always had assets. So that was very cool. So for those 15 years, that's pretty much what I did. And then uh, 1990, I went in, I got called back to active duty, went to SEAL Team 3, started working um, a training cell with Mike Martin and uh, 
K Bar and a couple other guys that were there. And, and were you a master chief at this point? No, no, I was a first class. Dang. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Because in the old days, rank never meant anything. I mean, some of yeah. those ops I was telling you about in Vietnam, we ran them as second class petty officers. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, so so the rank was never a big deal. And so, um, not till I got back on in 1990 did I realize that rank was a big deal. And I went, Jesus, I guess I better study. <laughs> so, so when the chief's test come around, I took the chief's test. We were Injimin then, not, you know, and it, so, there wasn't anything I didn't know about Injimin, so I passed how the fired test. Up, how fired up was Mike Martin to have you checking back into SEAL Team 3? Oh, he's great. Well, Mike, when, when Mike originally came back, he lived with me. You know, he moved in the house. We so after Vietnam, Mike got out. Yeah. And then what did he do? Because this Mike, is a good story. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Mike. Mike got on the Mike got on the bike I built him, and rode back to Ohio. That's where he met Gail, his wife. Right. So Mike went to work at the uh, steel mills back in Ohio, working the steel mills with his with his new Triumph motorcycle. Right. So he'd ride it there, and he was working there. That's where he learned to tattoo. You know, he ran into a guy back there that was a, a also a biker and learned how to tattoo from this guy, and, and that became his new career. Well, the steel mills, after 13 years, the C- steel mills were going to close down. So Mike went to a reunion in Florida and saw Steve Frisk, who was one of our, who Mike worked with in Vietnam. He was one of the two-man ops, right? Mm -hmm. Him and Steve would do the two-man ops together, and myself and Leon would do the two-man ops together. We went down there, saw Steve, and and Frisk was a commander, I think, in the teams at the time. And Steve goes, hey, if you want to come back in, I'll help you. So that's how it happened, right? Got back in um, because of a... um, Something vet, like an AMVET or something like that. I don't know what it was, but it was a program they had where they were trying to bring, you know, vets back on that had skills and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And Mike got it and fell into that category. Well, and then he calls me, you know, and I'm still in the corporate world doing business and stuff like that. He goes, hey, hey, it's me, Mike Martin. I go, I know a lot of Mike's who, you know, <laughs> me, you. <laughs> and so he starts going off on me, and I go, all right, Mike, I got it, I got it. So he came out, hung around. I gave him one of my bedrooms, and uh, and he lived with us till he got back on his feet and got his family moved out here, everything else. But w- what a wonderful deal for him, mm-hmm. right? Because the steel mills were down. There was no job for him back there, and he was able to get back on active duty and come back on active duty and everybody knows what a stud he was so that was just cool besides a wonderful personality wonderful man wonderful wonderful man great brother great great brother so we had we had tons of fun you know rehashing the thing and then all the new personalities at uh you know at at uh, at team three like Shirazi, you know, like, you know, and they were like on and on, like the Chang, right? So it was, uh, it, w- it was a welcome, you know, thing for me to come back into because being in the business world, you don't have that kind of camaraderie that you do with the guys, right? So the guys are there, and that's what it's all about anyway. It's about the brotherhood. It's about the camaraderie you have with one another coming back. And I know Mike and I miss both of that. And when we came back together at SEAL Team 3, it was just happening. So we let it go from there, you know, and it it proved to be fantastic. So I was in SEAL Team 3 from the 90s until 95. Mm -hmm. 95, I got... uh, Otters, which I was a chief now, uh, over to Stuttgart, Germany, to move Unit 2 from Macarhaney, Scotland, oh, okay. down to Stuttgart, right? I get over there, and I'm going, holy crap, oh, Germany, right? <laughs> and my wife was going, wow, Germany, because she's starting to travel, and she loves it, right? So we got over there, and then we got into the uh, into the world of uh, moving from Macarhaney, Scotland, we had to go get all the stuff mm-hmm. from the base at Macrahaney, Scotland, which is a story all its own, and drive it down to Stuttgart. And they gave us the worst base in Stuttgart to fix up, right? At Panzer Concern. Panzer Concern, yeah. Which was Rommel's old tank garage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and that's all, that goes a whole nother thing. Yeah. But the, we, the, we, the, uh, they still have the cranes 
oh, in absolutely. the bays there to pull the engines out of the Panzers. Yep. They're, all, they're in there. They're in the bays. It's like part of the building. I know. I know. All those all those cages that you see in there, guess who put those up? I'm, I'm reckoning you did. Yeah, yeah. So it was wild. But I had the ordnance department, training department at the time when we were moving then. So that was, that was a good thing. And then we got onto the ESAT team and the RST teams where we had to start so, doing. One second, you threw your wife into the scenario there. Yes, yes. Well, when did that all start? Oh yeah, well, <laughs> I probably should discuss that. My, my wife was my biggest supporter, right? So, you know, as, as we were going through this and going back on active duty in the 90s, she had never been involved in the Navy at all, mm -hmm. right? So Mikey and I are going out to Nylon to train the guys at Nylon, and I'm going, hey, honey, I'm going to be gone for a couple weeks. Well, she was a professional a woman, had her own career and stuff like that, and our son was, John was old enough to kind of take care of himself. So she'd say, okay, well, just call me, let me know what it is. So it wasn't that big of an mm -hmm. affair. So we were going, and then she worked for San Diego Gas and Electric. So when I got orders to Germany, she retired from San Diego Gas and Electric, and this was a new adventure for her. So she was all excited about going to Germany and everything else. And so it, it was great for her. I mean, she absolutely loved going there. Did you Was your son old enough to that he went to Germany or not? No, he was. Uh, he turned into a college boy. Oh, okay. College boy in my house paid for it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all, all my neighbors were calling me in Germany, going, "They're wrecking the house. They're wrecking the house." I'm going, "Holy crap!" So. <laughs> oh, you left him here going oh, yeah. to college in your house? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Big mistake. But you know what? We lived through it. That's the whole part. We lived through it. So she was very excited about it. So it was. It was a fun. It was a fun move because it was her first one as we go on through the career she's going this is not getting to be as much fun as i thought mm -hmm. right so she got there and we got moved on to kelly barracks right well because i was a chief i got the top floor right in the barracks well there's four floors 90 steps every mm -hmm. time you go up no elevators mm -hmm. so every time she would buy groceries the groceries would be waiting at the bottom of the <laughs> steps for guess who to carry up when i got home right Laundry, she'd bring the laundry down, I'd take the laundry back up. And it was like, oh, my God. So now I know why the Germans have such strong legs because they were <laughs> up and down those things. It was crazy. So that was a, it was a good move. We got into a, um, a real rhythm over there where we really justified – uh, general Lambert was the general there, and he loved, you know, naval special warfare. So we justified by being on the ESAT teams and being on these RST teams, we justified our existence there, and everybody wanted us to be there because anytime we would go on an operation, the operation would work perfect. That's where the NEOs came mm -hmm. into. Uh, we started doing the NEOs in Africa. And that's that's a non-combatant evacuation operation right, where. Right. There's something going wrong in a country, whether it's civil unrest, it could even be disease, it could be disaster, it could be anything, right. but there's a problem and somebody's got to get basically the Americans out of there, yes. you know? Yeah. And so, you know, you've seen them happen all over the world and you did, you did one where? Liberia or we Sierra did. Leone? Liberia. We did Liberia. We did one in Liberia. We did one in Brazzaville. We did one in Sierra Leone, and we used. I mean, you used all methods, and the reason they this is the reason why they wanted us on because we were the Marine piece to it. So if there was any landings that had to come, I had to survey the beaches before the guys got there. Had to make sure they had access on and off of the beach, all that kind of stuff. I was secure. That was my job. Plus, go into the embassies, find out what kind of supplies they have, what kind of food, what kind of medicine and all those kind of things. So when they called us to go down and do this, you kind of took control. You worked at the at the ambassador's Hess pretty much, but the military guy could take over at any time. Uh, yeah, because this is a, these operations are so vast in the responsibilities because you got security, obviously, yes. but you got logistics, you got medical. You oh, got totally. you got food supplies. I mean, there's all these things that have fuel, to take place. Everything, yeah. Fuel. I mean, yeah. it's like a it's a massive yep. undertaking to well, get we, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand people rounded up, that's right. marshaled into an area, 
and then extract it from that area. That's right. I mean that, and and keep them comfortable the whole time, at least oh, somewhat comfortable. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. you're going to hear about that too. Yes, you will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call my representative, but that's but that's the whole thing. That's I mean, we had to go out in town. I'll break it down. Just like the first one, the first one we went on was into Liberia. Liberia was, we landed in Sierra Leone. I used Sierra Leone as a safe haven. Um, and that was the best place to do that because we had just surveyed the airport and stuff like that. We and you flew- know when Sierra Leone is your safe haven, you know you're going into a rough neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Sierra Leone is that's, nasty. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's not the safest neighborhood anyway. So the um, so we flew in the Liberia, and the and the embassy was basically under siege. So we had to shut the siege down, close the gates up, take care of the bad guys that were there, and start. Uh, you know, vetting people coming into the the compound, the embassy, because the ambassador wanted to save as many people as possible. He said, that's great, but they're not bringing everything they got, especially people with American passports coming in. So we were, we probably flew 90 chalks out of there of people with, uh, with thing. And it, I mean, when you're flying in, you're flying in low. Uh, a rocket team tried to, to take us out going in and, and the door gunner with the minigun uh, got pointed in the right direction and that rocket team disappeared. So that was very cool. And so we flew in, we had to chop trees down, we had to move light poles, we had to do all this for this evacuation. Plus, we had to, to catalog everybody coming in, take care of medical stuff coming in and everything else. So our job was was big, was big. And the ambassador loved this, but but it was a big job. So we were on that siege probably for about two and a half weeks, mm-hmm. right? So the um, uh, we evacuated, I think, close, well, 90 chalk, so probably probably close to 1,500 people on that on that thing and getting them out there. And they were all people with American passports mm-hmm. are tied to an American passport, one or the other. So we, uh, we turned that whole thing over to the Marines when the MARG got there. That's their job. Mm-hmm. Uh, and everything, else, everything was pretty well done. We had to go back in the, in the, the country, fly in. We'd run security. We'd pick up people and, and bring them back. We had to recover the ambassador's Egyptian daughter, the Egyptian ambassador's daughter that got taken away by bad guys. So we had to go convince them that they didn't need to keep her. So we helped them with that decision, and then we uh, and then we got her back. So he was quite grateful and everything else. And then the and then the news media started showing up, and they wanted it going. But but in Liberia, they have a, a cannibal. Uh, community, mm-hmm. so we used to call them the street sweepers because in during the day when the battles were raging and stuff like that, all the dead people would be removed at night because the cannibals would come in and go whoopee. <laughs> So, roadkill. Roadkill. Roadkill for road, dinner. It's exactly, Just happened to be human. It happened to be here. That was classic, man. That was, uh, that, that's the first time I've ever seen anything like that. But it was uh, something I think every human being should see and realize that it's out there. Yeah. They, but it was wild. So we were able to successfully close that down and move on. A lot of first came out of that. That was the first time that a P3 had a camera mounted in it and was flying overhead and we could get the images from the city. Oh, nice. So that was very, very cool. And that was a 96. So, and you know how that's grown today mm-hmm. with all the drones and everything else today. So yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was quite an operation for a SEAL team to, to be there. And then you stayed, so you stayed in Germany and you did, the other thing that you mentioned, I mean, in order to prepare sort of logistically and just for planning purposes, you, you guys would travel around and go into countries and say, okay, if we have to do this in this country, yeah. here's some contacts, here's some people, here's some places, here's some recons, check these things out. And then also at this time, Bosnia was going on. Um, it hadn't kicked off yet. It was still kind of kind of bubbling up. You know, in the 90s, it was still going. Uh, we would fly around. We did probably like 11 different embassies where we put together packages on that and knew exactly what needed to be done if for some reason the the Americans in those particular countries had to be evacuated. So that's something that's a standard type of uh, operation. They just got us involved in it because we did a good job with it. And we had a, a team of Army guys, Air Force guys, and everything else, you know. And then I left, um, and then I left um, Germany in probably 98. And I, I'm trying to think, I probably had my first, 
We were in Bosnia because we were going to bond steel all the time. And I probably did, I don't know, like four months over there Mm -hmm. before I took off and headed back. But once I came back, then I was the, uh, I went to group one and then was the weapons officer there. And that's when the, uh, we put the Mark 46 and the Mark 48 Mm -hmm. into, into a contracting play and got, and got those two weapons designed. God bless you. Oh yeah. Those are hell of a weapons right there. The best, man. (laughs) As we call them, they're fire breathers. Yeah, they are. They are fire breathers. So we got that done, and as soon as I got that off and running and they started the manufacturing those, then I got sent to Spain. And that's when the uh, I took over the training department in Spain at Unit 10. And um, What we, year was that? That was 2000, 2000, okay. 2003. I went over there. Um, and we, that's when we started running Bosnia. We did a couple of African gigs then, but uh-huh. uh, Kosovo was there. Kosovo was still in Germany, too, because we were running it then. Mm-hmm. And that was, uh, you, let me back up a little bit, but the Kosovo War, as well as, as Bosnia, they were filthy wars. The, the uh, Yeah, the, mm-hmm. uh, the guys that were there, um, they were just the serves were fucking, you know, they were horrible people, horrible, horrible people. I don't know what possessed them to be the way that they are, but they were horrible people. They had no qualms about shooting innocents, none at all. And we had no qualms about shooting people with guns, so it was good. The um, You've always heard the story about the uh, the building where the, where the uh, 130 blew the corner of the building out because we couldn't find a sniper that mm-hmm. was in it. Okay, I was there when that happened. And I also was there when we uh, we went that we relisted in the paper on the paper building steps. There was like ten of us, and we were flipping off to the snipers when we were doing our reenlistment. It was great. It was great. <laughs> and so because uh, we had our counter snipers up, all we wanted to see was a barrel. Please let me see a barrel. <laughs> and so that was uh, that is actually when Sniper Alley just lost all its uh, support after we blew that that building down. Killing, trying to kill that one guy. There wasn't any other snipers that really were on Sniper Alley after that. So it kind of it kind of lost its uh, mm-hmm. its weight because they knew that we weren't going to hesitate to take the buildings down yeah. if we couldn't get the guys. So they would ask us in in Ramadi, you know, for good counter counter sniper technology, and and we'd say, you guys have the counter sniper technology. It's called an M1 Abrams tank. That's right. That's the best counter sniper that That's I've seen. Exactly oh, right. you want to shoot a snap from that building, or at least one of those buildings over there? Cool, watch this. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, those That's M1s, right. man. Those oh, things, those oh, things I know, stop the man. snipers. They, yeah, they do the trick. It's called overload, and there's a reason for it, right? That is so cool, so cool. But that was a good thing, and we so, would fly back and forth to Bosnia all the time. And then Kosovo was exactly the same thing. We'd be in the woods with uh, chasing those guys down in the woods, um, and it was um, you know that was our business, and we did a good job of it. Everybody loved having us there, all the United Nations people. So you were in Spain when September 11th happened. I was. I was in Spain when September 11th happened, and I had just come back from the range, walked into the training department. And was watching this on on the TV, and I go, "What movie is that?" It was no movie. Mm-hmm. It really, really sent us home, and we had to move back on base after September low. We had mm-hmm. to move back on base, and everybody started started going. How are we going to prep for it? Where are we going? We had uh, a couple people come by and talk to us um, that we were going to be doing different things. Uh, and we did those different things, right? But um, none of us, I don't think any of us at the time, left to go to Iraq. Mm-hmm. I think it was more of a supportive kind of thing that we had at 10 because I was still doing Africa gigs, mm-hmm. uh, going down to Africa at the time. Uh, I think most of the um, uh, Iraqi, you know, Afghanistan kind of thing at the time was still happening from east and west coast. Mm-hmm. That's what they broke it off. And Admiral Olson came by and told us that it's going to be a slow crawl. We're not mm-hmm. going to, it's for the long term. We're going to take our time. We've got to plan. We've got to make sure we don't burn out our guys. Right? So that was, that was good information. 
good information. Then I left you Spain. You think he was thinking 20 years at that time? I think that he's a smart enough guy where he was going, yes, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, he's a very smart guy. I no love doubt. Admiral Olsen. Yeah. Great, great guy. No, every, all the senior officers, especially the officer detailer who I called. Yeah. Uh, and said, hey, get me to a SEAL team, please, right now. He was like, this thing's going to last a long, long time. Yeah. You know, and yeah, he's right. So then wh where did you go when you got done with Spain? Uh, then I came back to, because that was like 2003, I came back to trade it. That's when Ronnie Cooper, Joe Byrne, <laughs> All the boys we put together uh, Trade at One. Got it. And I was the ops chief for Trade at One. Right. So uh, Mike Turcott was, uh, if you know Mike, he was the he was the boss in the op shop. So we started putting together that, which was uh, fascinating. And I did that from the inception of Trade at to like 2005. Mm -hmm. And then I got a call from a good buddy of mine, um, Doug McNutt. I don't know whether you know him or not, but he was yeah. a detailer. And he goes, hey, because uh, George Young had gotten hit w w over when he was over in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And he needed a place to kind of settle because he was getting retired. I said, well, you take my shop, my spot here, and uh, I'll find some place else to go. And so that's when Doug McNutt, I thought I was going to stay on the West Coast, right? <coughs> he goes, I got a hard-to-fill billet. I go, hey, where is it at, man? He goes, Hawaii. I go, Hawaii? Hard to fill billet in Hawaii? He goes, yeah, I, I need an ops chief over in Hawaii. I said, well, you know, I'll go. Not knowing I have to go to SDV school oh. <laughs> to go to this billet, right? So now I'm a senior citizen almost. <laughs> and, and Doug's going, yeah, you got to go to SDV school. Are you a school. master chief yet? Uh, I made Master Chief at SDV school. Okay. So, so was, interestingly, George was my third platoon chief. Right. And then when I took over Trade at was when he was the Master Chief of Trade at. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. So that George was Young? Cool. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, so that's probably his what he did have when he went to the hot, took my job, and then he became – because I, I think Ron Cooper was the uh, Master Chief at Trade Ed, and he probably relieved Ron Cooper. Yeah, after probably. That. Probably. Yeah. So anyway, uh, off to uh, 2005. So off you go to, to SDV SD school. SD school in Panama City, How Florida. How old were you? Uh, I was like 56 at the Get time. Get some. Oh, yeah. Oh, For yeah. those of you that don't know what an SDV is, Echo. Yes, sir. It's a SEAL delivery vehicle. It's a miniature submarine, but it's not a submarine that keeps you dry. It's yeah. called a wet submarine. So it's got a motor on it, and it's it's enclosed, but water comes in and out of it. So you wear a scuba rig inside of this thing, and because otherwise, you know, you'd have to worry about pressurizing this thing, and yeah, it have to be yeah. this hole, and you have to get in and out of it, and that, all that would make it too complicated. So they just take a basically a shell, put a motor in it, and then you get inside the shell, and you drive this small underwater submarine is that that like real claustrophobic one? Oh yeah is you'd be oh yeah if you're yeah, yeah okay it's very claustrophobic. yeah my friend Jeremy, uh, tell especially me about that. if you're a big guy <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's not it's it takes a lot of skill to drive them yeah. and that and when you have a driver you, you want to keep that driver that's real good at it i was not real good at driving the boat because i needed my glasses <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's what they get uh, for sending a 57 year old that's right, to SDV that's exactly school. right so so anyway the, how long is that school the school is three months at least it's in florida oh yeah but but still you're doing what eight hour dives and oh, shit yeah, like that all the time <sighs> all the time taking the boat apart putting the boat back together doing it i mean you're just you're doing what you have to do at to, least you got your motorhead your motorhead oh uh, yeah stuff absolutely i mean satisfied. i i could take the boats apart and put them back together driving them was the, you know a whole nother thing right and stay keeping them keeping them level and all that kind of stuff hey when you can't the read the, when you can't read the numbers on the depth <laughs> gauge that's right. going to be a challenge <laughs> get me where's my glasses <laughs> that's why i always let somebody else drive and i, I, I would ride them back going on but it was uh but it was interesting it was an interesting time it's something i i kind of enjoyed i wish i was better at it but but i wasn't but i still went the sdv team in hawaii so i went to the team in hawaii i became the uh the uh, combat systems officer over there because uh jim morrell at the time was retiring 
And so I took over his job, and that is where we started working and doing a whole lot of very, very cool things that they're doing today. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it was, a, it was a fun gig. I mean, it was a fun tour over there. And then when I left that, I actually went to work on our dry submarine that was over mm-hmm. there, and it kind of burned up, so I kind of lost my job <laughs> over there, which really pissed me off because I was really getting good at paddle boarding. And so, <laughs> the, uh, so, uh, so I had to come back to, uh, to Warcom, and that's where I took the program over in N8, and that's kind of where I, I wrapped up my career, was running that program uh, and running the palms and the funding lines and everything else mm-hmm. to keep the new SDVs because now we have a new one. And uh, keeping that and keeping the boys trained and getting them the gear that they need. And and it's evolved a lot mm-hmm. since I had that had that particular job. So it's, uh, so it's been very, very interesting. It's been a very interesting career. I mean, so, for, uh, so 1967, you joined the Navy, and now it's 2014. Yeah, the end of 2014 is, is, when, when, is I, when you finally retire. Yeah, yeah, after 47 years. Oh yeah, wild. <laughs> That's wild. And and just for to note to How to, to all of retired? to all of your clients, I was uh, I was retired for six months and then they sucked me back in. So <laughs> I still work over there. <laughs> Yes, every day I go in to do things. And, and now I'm working analyst stuff that's uh, for Naval Special Warfare, and it's very exciting. I mean, I think, and, and Jocko will tell you the same thing. I mean, once you work for the boys and you're working for the boys and for their health and their benefit, you want to keep doing that because they're out there on the front lines, They and they require people just like us to keep pushing and keep doing the best we can do because we're we're speaking for them. They've got more than enough to do when you're out there in the war zone. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's when I was I was the admiral's aide for 13 months and one of the things that my boss would say in these big meetings, he'd say what does that what does that do for our SEAL platoons? That's right. And and that's the always the reminder for all the guys it was at Warcom cuz Warcom's really elevated. They're looking at things. You know, I remember I'd go to a meeting, they'd be talking about what kind of boat engine are we going to have in 2028 yes right yeah and and i'd be thinking to myself how does this matter and that's what he would say he'd say how does this affect the seal platoon yep. like how is this going to because you know what the seal teams are going to be here in 2028 oh, and absolutely. you know what they're going to need a boat engine that's right and so if we don't plan for it and don't figure out what the best one is right now smart guys looking at it that have operational experience and that mm-hmm. care yes then they'll end up with a, a piece of shit but if you do it right, that's how we got the the Mark forty eight and the Mark forty six, right? That's exactly. Because someone right. like you was saying, okay, this is what we need. Yep, yep, yeah, yeah. It's very true. And if you don't have people doing that, and and pushing the future envelope, then you'll always be behind the power curve. All of our peer to peer competitors are doing exactly that, mm-hmm. and and some of them are doing a better job than we're doing at it. So yeah. you, we have to we have to push harder. That's a, that's our job. And so there's your retirement. There's like. 1,500 people show up for your retirement. Right. There was more, but they couldn't get in. <laughs> it was at the uh, at the Lowe's okay. Hotel. Yeah, there was uh, – I mean, people are piling in from everywhere. I mean, and I didn't know I knew that many people, but evidently I did. <laughs> so it was wild. It was wild. And you had five people speak? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they were all great. I mean, they were all, all people that had a very important part – of my career as I went through Naval Special Warfare. You know, I mean, the um, guys that were E-5s with me that were now two-star admirals, they spoke, <laughs> right? My, I, I mean, I, I think I'm one of the only guys that's had a, an instructor from their training class come and speak at their retirement, you know? I had- uh, Who is that? Mother Moy. Oh, no kidding. Mother Moy. I mean, the best CEO I had, John McTie, was there. He spoke at it. You know, it was it was fantastic, you know. So it was uh, it was very cool. It was very, very cool retirement. I couldn't have asked for it to be any better. 40, yeah. 47 years. You you wrap up with, that career. Yes. Go ahead. No, that's, that was with waivers. So, okay. <laughs> Yeah, no kidding. A lot of waivers. A lot of waivers. A lot of waivers. And uh, and then you you still are working for Naval Special Warfare, but at some point you realized that there was another mission that you wanted to get out. You wanted to attack. 
Um, Absolutely. How, how did you how did you get involved with with your next mission that you got involved with? I will. Um, yeah, let me go in. Let me go into that. I had an old team guy. It seems like it always happens with an old team guy, uh, Jeff Bramstead, who was uh, who was a sky god. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jeff, I know Bram. Jeff came to me um, when I right after I retired and says, "Hey, I need your help." Um, with this particular project that I'm, I've taken on. And I went, well, what's the project? And he told me it was child trafficking. And I said, well, you know, I mean, I've dealt with that all over the world, and we've saved thousands and thousands of kids all over the world because of, you know, assholes that, that want to abuse them and use them. And I said, you know, we've done that. He said, but, but this is American kids on American soil. That kind of piqued my interest. He had a um, uh, one of the PhDs at um, USD had written a white paper. Amy Carver Carpenter, she had written a white paper. I read the white paper and I just went, "Wow!" I, I had no idea that three thousand children a year in Southern California were being either kidnapped or put into human trafficking in one form or another. And I said, you know, I have to get involved in this some way. So I met Joseph Travers, who is the um, is the co-founder of Saved in America. Saved in America is a nonprofit organization. We don't charge the parents any money at all to go locate their children. The children have, or the parents have to come to us. They give us the power of attorney of the child. And then the child becomes ours to locate, to find, locate, and identify, which they do. Many of them have. We've recovered over 200 kids so far. We will take that power of attorney. We will find the child. We'll locate the child, identify the child, and then we work with local law enforcement and have local law enforcement come in and recover the children give the children to us so we can take the children to medical care, get any DA evidence off of them, and then we will take them into uh, a counseling type thing or a safe haven so that they can come down off the drugs. The majority of them have heroin in them. They have some type of drugs that keep them, you know, in a very lethargic state so that these um, pimps and predators (coughs) can do whatever they want with them. Very, very sad state and a heinous crime. When you're dealing with um, these situations, where are these children coming from? How, how does it happen? They um, they come from many different areas. Uh, the uh, Southern California is one. We've they come from all over the country. They come from poor families. They come from rich families. Uh, there's not any. Uh, demographics on exactly how they get there um, that we've been to determine yet. So we're only into a a little bit over 200 kids so far. We've been working in Southern California. That's where our main location is at. We get a lot of support, philanthropic support from the community, philanthropic support from the government. So it's uh, the local government, I mean. And that's the um, that's kind of where we've been focused at. Now we've gone all the way to Florida to recover kids. We've gone to Utah to recover kids. We've gone to uh, Phoenix, Arizona to recover kids. And so that's what we're doing now is we're expanding Saved in America from San Diego. We're over in Las Vegas at the end of the month. They had uh, recovering kids. We've probably got four kids over there that we've got. Uh, information and intel on that we will go seek and find, call in local law enforcement and have them recover the children, just as I mentioned. Local law enforcement loves us because we're a huge asset to them in helping them find, you know, these kids because they they don't have the time. They're so overworked, so mm-hmm. over barren by, you know, runaway kids or kids that gets, you know, into trafficking. They don't have the they don't have the resources to do as much as they would like to do. So it's it's very frustrating to law enforcement. So when law enforcement hears about us, they are totally in tune to say, hey, come in and help us. All of us are private investigators. 
We're all insured and licensed. We all are CCW carriers. We have a whole network of private investigators throughout the United States that we can call on, the NEMAC people. So if we know that a child's been taken to another state, we will call a PI in that particular state. He will volunteer his time to go see if he can locate that child at a particular address or where we kind of direct him. If he finds the child, then we will fly a team from San Diego here to go set up, do the surveillance, do the watching, and everything that's required to identify that child to call in local law enforcement. That's how we've been working to date to recover these over 200 kids. Now, this is a heinous crime. It's a crime that I have to ask everybody in your audience. I have to ask every grandparent, every parent that's out there to please be on the watch and be able to identify what's happening with these child trafficking things. These, these pimps, these perverts are taking these kids. They have to take them in public every now and then just to keep them. They keep them locked up most of the time in houses. And if you see them out on the street, don't be afraid to go f- seek law enforcement and ask law enforcement that something is not right with this particular situation because you may be saving that child's life. And that's what we want to do. That's why we're here. This all, our whole organization is about the children. That's why we are, are bound not to charge the parents for doing this. People have charged parents in the past thousands of dollars and never found their child for them. And, and how heart-wrenching is that? To be a parent, you've already lost your child, and now you're paying thousands of dollars to some unscrupulous person. Uh, and they're not locating your child. We'll locate your child. Usually the day, it takes three to four days to locate a child, no matter where they're at in the United States. We've got, I've got great computer people. I've got great people that work behind the scenes to assist and help us, even in Mexico sometimes, but we hardly ever go outside the United States um, because we work so well with law enforcement and supporting them. So this is the word I want to get out. We need your help. We need your support. Please go to our website, which is savedinamerica.org, and it, the whole story is there. It's all about the teams. We have, we're made up of retired special operations guys and retired police officers, some FBI guys, some old agency guys that I've worked with in the past, and I have a whole slew of IT guys that support us with chasing the Internet because that's where it all starts from. So that that's where that's what I was going to ask you. When you see, what are some warning signs for parents to look out for, grandparents to look out for? Obviously, the internet has got to be a huge one right now. Oh, totally. To- the the internet is the is the is the media that gets them started, right? And a lot of them, uh, we call it the Don Juan guys. So you have an older guy that is pursuing a younger girl promising error, all these kind of things. That's one thing you got to watch out for. When you're, If your daughter or your son shows up with expensive purses or different gifts and things like that, where are they getting it? They're getting it from these pimps because these guys are trying to lure them in to what a good life that they can show them if the, as long as they can possess them. And the Don Juans will keep them for two or three months you know, as, as a girlfriend or something like that, then one day they will sell her and she'll be gone. Then if she's gone, they will sell her on the weekends, only the weekends because they'll bring them home so you can feed them all week long. And then on the weekends you won't see them because the pimp will have them out selling these girls. And I have to remind you that, you know, a one person that gives um, – that these pimps do that is worth, and they sell them throughout that weekend in a year's particular time, one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars a year. So that's just an idea. It's better than any drug that pimp or that drug dealer could push because they use them, they bring them back, they let them go back to either a community home during the week because they don't have to feed them, they don't have to keep them, or your house. And, and then on the weekends, they just call them up and off they go. It's, you know, and you, the kids are 14 years old. So, you know, you kind of say, what does a 14-year-old know? A 14-year-old doesn't know a whole lot, right? 
and they don't listen to their parents as well as they should. So it's kind of up to the parents to be able to be ready for the warning signs, be ready to do something. And if you have any questions at all, go to our website, savedinamerica.org, and ask the question. And we can get you steered to a counselor, get you steered to something that's going on in the cities. Uh, like I say, if we're in, if one of the cities that we're involved in, we have counselors, we have people that you could talk to in those cities. Man, you said three thousand in Southern California. Yes, shocking. That's that's why I got involved. That's what, so imagine if that's what you have in Southern California. Imagine what you have nationwide. That is, it's it's a crime and it's a heinous crime that nobody wants to talk about. You, you, I mean, they're talking about child trafficking. They're talking about the immigration problem and everything else, but nobody's talking about the child trafficking inside the United States of American kids, right? And it's done by all kinds of unscrupulous people. I mean, the first ring we busted here in San Diego was run by Russians on Pacific Coast Highway. And we, I, I was blown away when I went there. So these guys are, they got multiple girls, underage girls, yes. and they've somehow gotten them off wherever they pulled them out of their houses. They've, they've lured them in somehow. Yes. They've gotten them on drugs. Yes. So they've got them in a, in a flaccid state of mind where they're, they're not thinking straight. And then they're just, they're just uh, selling them. Yep, they're a tool. And you, uh, let me go back a little bit. But in every middle school that we have here in San Diego, which is going to be shocking to many of the people that are listening, is that they are recruiters. The gangs have recruiters inside the middle schools that are trying to recruit these girls far the Don Juans so that the drug cartels and the gangs have these as income sources. So if you go, the only, uh, I mean, the schools have been real slow to recognize that this is happening and they are still real slow to get programs in place to teach these kids about these recruiters that are in the middle schools. I mean, middle schools, it's 14 years old, 13, 14 year old, that these recruiters are trying to recruit these girls and boys into this gang styled life, or style of life, so that they can sell them on the weekends, bring them home to mom and let them be school girls during the week, and then traffic them on the weekends. So that is, that's something that's going on today. So everybody has to be aware of that. And that's why I asked parents and grandparents to please keep your eyes open and be aware of these kind of things because there is that evil out there and it is happening every day in our world. Yeah, and these kids these days, like what you're talking about is exactly what the, I don't know what the trend, I guess you call it the trend of, you know, with social media, oh, I'm gonna be rich, I'm gonna be mature, I'm gonna have a cool car. Oh, there's drugs. Cool. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be mature girl, even though I'm only 14 years old. And so they they see that and they get offered that, and that's you know I could imagine that's how a girl gets lured into these horrible situations. It's exactly exactly right. I want to be older than I am, and I want more stuff. My family can't provide this for me, but my my honey over here can provide it for me he gets me new dresses new purses all that kind of stuff those are the kind of things and those are kind of the red flags that every parent needs to be aware of man all right so uh saved in org is the website you got your team on there bunch of old team guys too bunch of guys i know on there. oh yeah awesome oh, yeah. and and all guys that now have their private PI license, so you guys are actually out doing the recon work if needed. Oh, absolutely. Where the we're doing all the where the rubber meets the road, we're there. We and that's that's how we find these kids. I mean, you know, the the police department, if they had the resources to do it, I know they of would course. be doing it, but they don't have the resources, and that's why that's why we're holding a fundraiser in November on November seventh at the Estonia Hotel in La Jolla. Um, please go to our website. Everything is on there. If you can afford to come to the event, it's going to be fantastic. Um, we have how many a, seats you got? We probably have about five hundred. Okay. So, what was the date on that? 
November the 7th. Okay. It'll be at 6 p.m. Uh, our website has all the information on it, and you can buy tickets off our website. Uh, if you got any questions about it, please just go to the website, send us a question. We'll answer that. It's for corporate um, people. They can buy tables of 10 for all of the other people that they have or all their employees. Uh, they can donate. They can do. There's so many things that they can do to help sponsor us and help support us. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'll tell you what, we've been going almost two hours right now. Um, I think this may be a good time to wrap up. Um, I'll tell you right now, I'm going to listen to this and I'm going to have about a thousand more questions for you. Okay, that's good. Because I was just getting warmed up. I mean, <laughs> you know, when we start talking, I mean, the stuff about Vietnam and, I, you know, the fact that you did 100 missions, you probably debriefed three of them, four of them maybe here briefly. Uh, I'm going to start thinking about those and. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna come up with all kinds of new questions and uh, it'd be awesome if you could come back on because I, I guarantee everybody that's listening to this is gonna wanna hear more. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and, and there's, you know, we a long time ago, a friend of mine put together a book. I got like 20 guys from Vietnam to all write a story called the, the book was called The Men Behind the Trident by Dennis Cummings. And there's like 20 different stories of, you know, the people's, the first contact action mm -hmm. that they had in Vietnam. Uh, one of my stories is in there, but it's a it's a great read um, and it's out on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, so if you guys get a chance, go spin through that. That's well, a, interesting. I actually have that book. Oh, good. I was looking at it today. Um, what I'll do is we'll we'll do it. Next time you come on, we'll go through your story. We'll oh, talk yeah. about some more stories. And and that way, I seldom give out books that I'm gonna cover on the podcast prior to covering them. I don't think, and, and it, sometimes people get mad. They go, please tell us what books you're gonna cover. <laughs> and, I, and I don't do it because I don't even know what books I'm gonna cover. Sure. There's so many books that I'm, I'll be, I'm reading five, six books at a time, and I'll go, okay, this one, I like this part, and I'll, and I'll cover that book, because I cover a lot of books on the podcast. Sure, sure. But yeah, so now everyone has a heads up. It's, it's Men Behind the Trident. Men Behind the and Trident. And it's by Cummings. Yeah, Cummings. And we'll cover that next time you come on. All right, beautiful. And that would be awesome. You got anything else? And anything then, else you, know, you want to add? Just uh, I want to, before I jump off, I want to thank you, all of you for your support to uh, Saved in America. We definitely need it. And make yourselves more aware of the human trafficking that's going on in the United States of America of, hu of U.S. children. They're not foreign kids. They're U.S. kids. Yeah. Well, once again, uh, Master Chief, Kirby, Sir, <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for what you did for the country. Thanks for what you did to the Navy. Thanks for what you did for the teams. As I already said, it was your generation of SEALs that built the foundation Absolutely. of the tactics, of the operational excellence, and of the standard of will and of perseverance. That's never going to be forgotten. It's what gave me my life right on. So what gave me my life is you guys so thanks for doing that thanks for coming on and it's an honor to be part of a brotherhood that you're a member of <laughs> and thanks for having me and we love the brotherhood long live the brotherhood indeed sir thank All right. you and master chief kirby harrell has left the building real quick he didn't mention this uh, if, for social media for Saved in America is at Saved in America on Twitter, at Saved in America on the Instagram, and at Saved in America on Facebook. So there you go. Check that out, follow that, support that situation. And you know, we started off, to, I started off talking about learning how to act, learning how to get better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Echo. Yes. Are you looking to get better? Yes. Are you trying to learn how to act better? Trying to, yeah. I even worked out today. How do you feel about that? I feel good about that. I hope you did. I did, man. Any other things that we can do to get better? Yes, we in can. In our lives. Oh, yeah, big time. <laughs> we can. Uh, immersion camp coming up. I know, sold out. But the point is, you do jujitsu. It's what you do. Highly recommend. Bro, we were... 
Yeah, just the other day when we were waiting before we recorded, mm-hmm. and we're sitting there, jujitsu's going on. Mm-hmm. Your boy's there doing oh, yeah. his jujitsu. Mm-hmm. Other friends doing jujitsu, and I'm sitting, standing there, looking at it, listening to you, of course, and just watching people do jujitsu. Yeah, even and watching ju- people do jujitsu when you understand jujitsu is really like cool. filling my heart, just <laughs> filling it to the brim. And I'm like talking to you. And then I even said, I was like, bro, you just is so good, man. Yeah. And I'm just watching people, you know, beginners, whatever, mm. uh, uh, high level guys, whatever. It's so good. Nonetheless, when you do it, it's even better than watching it. You'll know. Ask the people who do it, you'll know. Mm-hmm. They'll tell you. When you do it, you're going to need a gi, of course. And what gi are you going to get? None other than the best gi. Unless you want the worst gi, I don't know. But if you want the best one, you get the Origin Gi. Get the best Gi from OriginMain.com. Made in America. From the dirt to the shirt. Yes. From the seed to the Gi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah. we got we got a bunch of awesome craftsmen up in Maine. Craftsmen up in Maine making these Gi's. They're also making Gi's. They're making rash guards for no Gi, I meant to say. Mm-hmm. They're making... Shirts, t-shirts, sweatshirts. They're also making jeans right yeah. now. Yeah. Jeans. Is there, I mean, jeans are as American as apple pie, apple pie yeah. right? Sure. Blue jeans. So get yourself some blue jeans. You want American jeans, Yeah. right? Are there even any, Amer- I mean, there has to be, I don't know there are, any though. There are some, and you know what they do? They make these Hipster American jeans, jeans, and they sell them for two hundred and eighty dollars. Yeah, that's what they do. Okay, so you don't want those jeans. Yeah, unless you do, I don't know. But no, you don't. But these are not that. And so, originmain.com, get yourself some, some clothing of all kinds, yeah. including clothing for training, including clothing for working, and for cruising. Cruising. Yeah. yeah. All good. Of course. <laughs> also, you want to keep your body intact as well while training mm-hmm. or while just cruising, whatever, but or recovering. Mm-hmm. How about that? Yes, you do. Yes. Joint Warfare? Yes. The, the Just go read the reviews on Joint Warfare yeah. and then get some. Yeah. Because I can sit here and tell you that I take Joint Warfare. Three in the morning, three at night. You take. Do you take three in the morning, three at night? Three. I w- I was doing that when I when I had like when you were injured. Ish, yes. Now you backed off. I'm back on the. Uh, yeah, I just do three. Okay. Read the reviews. See what other people say. Mm-hmm. Because there's people that are like, oh, my mom had bad arth whatever arthritis problems. Yeah. And they go on joint warfare, which has active proven things in it. Curcumin. Right, turmeric, <laughs> turmeric, yeah, all those things. So yeah, yeah. joint warfare. Get the krill oil. Krill oil for sure. Get that's the, the combo right there. Yeah, that's the combo. That I that's the with. that's the dual hitter. Get that dual hitter. Oh video. yeah, big time. The and here and I'm not recommending to do this, but for sake of this kind of experiment, for lack of a better term, if you're already on joint warfare and krill, try go off it. See what happens. I don't recommend that. Yeah, yeah. Don't really do it. I mean, that's just a, it's more of a dare than anything, but Brad, go off it. Yeah, I've done it's it. It's not smart. Out of complacency it's or whatever. It's no good. Okay, when you do legs, when you squat, mm-hmm. guess what you're going to need? Additional protein. Because the steak ain't going to cut it. So when you squat, cut it. when you do clean, you ever do heavy cleans? And like the next day, your whole posterior chain is yeah. like sore. Yeah. It needs, it's, you know what it's saying to you? It's going, mulk. <laughs> Send us yeah, more. So go. listen to your body. You know, people say that. You gotta listen to your body. You yes. know what your body's saying? Your body's saying, give milk. me some more. <laughs> Boy. All right, well, there you go. <laughs> so get yourself yeah. some of those milk. Get yourself a, you know what I do? When I do, when I do legs, when I get done, I don't normally do this because it, it's pretty early in the morning. And I'm usually not hungry in the morning, but when I do legs, a lot of times I'll get done. I'll have a little handful of nuts. You know, we're talking seven o'clock in the morning, a little mm-hmm. handful of mixed nuts, which people got to kick out. I don't have the way I say that. Yeah, sure. And then I'll do a little one scoop hitter. Okay. And is this right? Milk. This is like an hour. Maybe yeah. This two. Is, yeah. Maybe like two hours after. Yeah. So, so for you, me, that's kind of. So you don't believe in the anabolic window. You know what that is? Yeah, I know what it is. I wouldn't say I'm not a believer, but it's just not something that I, I, I eat when I'm hungry. I listen to my body. <laughs> my body wants more. Well, here's the thing, though. I I have th- I thought it was to me in my mind it was proven 
the anabolic window. Right when you're done working out, you Probably go is. into recovery mode. Then I read like all this stuff. Oh, that's not true. Your yeah. hormones do this and do that and growth hormone and all this like good stuff as far as you go. It's but, weird. Man, so know, check man. this out. The things that I've been saying, okay, like I used to say, I go eat steak all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, I eat steak, 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 people. And then people, all of a sudden, that's a nor that's an actual thing now. The carnivore diet only, oh, yeah. like it's a real thing now. Yeah. That same thing with me. I'd be like, I, eat, I don't eat breakfast. I don't like to eat until you know ten, eleven o'clock. All of a sudden, it's called something. It's called intermittent fasting, yeah. right? Yeah. This is just stuff I just kind of live live that way. Right. So now all of a sudden, same thing with people saying, oh, uh, uh, your 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 discipline depletes throughout the day. Wrong. It's actually wrong. Now it's proven wrong. I, I was right. Yeah. Well, so anyways, what I'm saying is listen to your body. Your, mm -hmm. The people say this, listen to your body. I'm saying, been saying that too. Well, I'm saying it right now. Well, listen to your body. You know what your body says? Your body's saying milk. Bring yeah. It. <laughs> my <laughs> wife, my wife mixed up a strawberry milk with the, do you have one of those nice blenders? Yes. Like the power blenders that yes. has like a, like a 40 horsepower engine in it. Yes, sir. I do. My wife mixed up a milk in there and she, I come home and she's like, I mixed a milk in one of those things. <laughs> And she was talking like almost in a sensual voice, yeah, right? I and I go, it. okay. And she goes, she said something she never said. She goes, it was next level, which she never <laughs> says that. And then she goes, she goes, it's the best thing I've ever tasted in my life. That's what she said to Dang, me. She said those she words to me. Up it's the it, best it. thing I've ever tasted in my life. This is a protein shake, yeah. right? Hmm. That, let's let's face That's it. That's interesting. That's something, right? <laughs> not nothing. That's I'll not nothing that. at all. So yeah, and don't forget we got warrior kid milk because sometimes your body, you, your kids, oh, yeah. you know what their body, their brain, their brain is saying, give me sugar. Yes. Right, their brain's like, give me a, give me a chocolate chip cookie. Yes. Right, to answer that call, answer that call, instead of giving them the poison, give them something that answers the call but makes them help stronger, yeah. faster, smarter, better. Yeah. Give them some warrior kid milk. Although I would not recommend that you tell your kids to listen to their body. Because the kids would be like, hey, my body's telling me I want some fucking candy. <laughs> well, if my kids no, are any I'm indicator, saying, that's yes, what they're... you listen. You you feed them the right thing. So, milk. Yeah, because kids listen to their taste buds. They don't listen to their body. That's what I'm saying. They yes, you're right. So, when your kids' taste buds call out for that that little sweetness hitter, yeah, yeah, yeah. give them, what, the give them kid, something boom, good. Boom, slides yes. right in. Slides right in. Oh, no fractor. Yeah. Easy money. Good. So, there that's you good. go. Right on. And, and don't forget about white tea. Jocko white tea tastes good. Did you notice when Sean Parnell was on the podcast? He's like, this stuff has so much caffeine in it. And I was like, mm -hmm. no, actually it doesn't. There's only 60 grams. Yeah. What you're feeling is the antioxidant kicker. <laughs> well, <laughs> and he well, did drink four of them. He did drink them. four of them. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what, what I was saying. Know. And here's the thing. I've drank four of them too. Oh. Before and the caffeine sneaks up on you because mm. you keep, you're just, it's like a steady dose of caffeine. You're like, yeah. oh, okay. yeah. So, and he's, you know, you know, when you're in conversation and talking yeah. about stuff or whatever. So, oh yeah, he got hit with a double, triple whammy situation. Check. Also, Jocko has a store. It's called Jocko Store. And this is where we, we collectively. Mm -hmm. We can get rash guards there. Oh yeah. Let's say get when after you do, it. When you do ring workouts mm -hmm. using your rings, you need to, you kind of need to wear a rash guard. Yeah. Because you'll get, crazy. you'll get like, uh, what is it? R R rope burn. Cheek. Yeah, basically strap burning. chafing yeah. on your arms. Yeah, I got that. I don't do mine's not as intense as yours, the workout, but I'll, you know, you do like dips and, and some push up yeah. situations or whatever, you know, the various things. And I felt the chafing. My workout wasn't long enough on the rings. It wasn't long enough to actually get chafing, but <laughs> there I was a chafing indication. Yeah. In <laughs> that's so you get rash guards. You can yeah. also get t shirts. The t shirts that I wear, JP Denell sent me a picture of these cleaning out his closet. Mm hmm. Getting rid of shirts. <laughs> and I was like, that's why all my shirts are the same. Yep. It's all my shirts are the same. Yeah. If you like the shirts that I wear or you like the shirts that Echo wears, you can just get the shirts there at jockostore.com. Yep. Discipline equals freedom. Represent. Mm -hmm. Defcore. Defcore. Represent. Someone was representing Defcore the other day, and I had a little bit of sort of a of a little connect, right? Because yep. yeah, you're kind of yeah. stepping up. If oh, yeah. If Bro, <laughs> and JP, speaking of JP, he posts a picture of one of the troopers representing big time in the wild at the UFC. 
Oh yeah, that's right. There was a guy at the UFC. I saw it too. I tried to take a picture, didn't get there quick enough. And my little daughter, who was watching the UFC with me, check. She was like, "Oh, you didn't get a picture." And I go, "Someone's gonna post it. Watch." Yeah. Yep. And someone posted even before JP. And my little brother texts me before JP texts me with it. Text me and says, hey, someone uh, at, was at the UFC wearing you guys' shirt. Yeah. He Just said, someone's at the UFC wearing the shirt that you designed, Echo Charles. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. But nonetheless, Check. he did indicate. So the point there is, yeah, when you see when you see another person in the wild representing hardcore. On the UFC. Oh, on the UFC or otherwise. Mm, true. But you will. You'll feel that connection. And Jock will feel, I feel it too, man. And I Bona think fides. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, connected. Oh, so yeah. that's that. Also, you can also get a trucker hat. Or flex. Or yeah. flex it. Or you can get a beanie. Winter is coming. Yeah. Uh, hoodies, heavy, heavy, medium, light. Heavy and light. Medium, heavy, light. I, th- I think they're heavy. They're mm. heavy. They're normal hoodies is okay. what I'm saying. And Fair light. enough. Yeah, a lot of cool stuff. I got a new design coming out. Didn't even tell you. Boom. Oh, that's a big surprise. But it's, uh, you it's know. probably it's, lame. No, it's not lame. <laughs> I, I predict that you will like chance. that one. There's nope. a 50-50 chance. Well, there's no. F- seriously. Yeah. 50% of the time when you show me something, I'm like, dang, that's dope. 50% of the time I go, I don't like that at all. <laughs> dang, <bro. laughs> all right. Well, there you Check. go. We're going to see about that one. And I predict that you'll like it. But, okay. but whichever, cool. you know, it's cool. it's uh, it's out. It'll be, yeah, it's out big time. Right on. Anyway, yeah, jockostore.com. There it is. Boom. Also, subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. Google Play, iTunes, Stitcher, you know, wherever you get your podcast. And don't forget about the Warrior Kid podcast. We got that as well. If you're. If you got kids, or if you're an adult that just wants to get after it more, yeah, go right. to the Warrior Kid podcast, and you can also support a Warrior Kid by going to IrishOaksRanch.com and getting some, getting some Jocko soap, made by Aiden, from goat milk on his farm, in America. America. Yeah, big time. stay clean, stay clean, big time. Also, why are you staying clean? If you want to watch some YouTube videos, don't watch the drunk girl fail videos. Mm. We have a YouTube channel. We have excerpts on there from the podcast. A lot of people watch those excerpts yeah. because, you know, every once in a while they'll miss, the, you know, this, you know, two hour podcast about, you know, something. Maybe they didn't have the time or whatever. Maybe it's happened. It's, it's happened before. I'm saying that. Mm-hmm. But they'll catch the excerpts so they can really get yeah. many of the lessons. You know, you, you, know you need to saying? make BTF Tony compilation that's three going. minutes long of him just saying <laughs> awesome stuff. <laughs> Yeah, it'll be longer than please, three minutes. I'll please, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm saying just take the top highlights of them yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it still might be more than three minutes. It might be a. It might be an 88 minute video. <laughs> yeah, that is yeah. a good idea. But YouTube. nonetheless, the point is, yes, we do have a YouTube channel and a lot of cool stuff. If you want to see what Kirby Harrell looks like, yeah, then you can you can watch the whole pod. This whole podcast will be on YouTube. You can see what he looks like. See his expressions. We also have psychological warfare, which is a little. Sonic boost for your brain that will make you think the right thoughts that you know you're supposed to be thinking. It's called psychological warfare, and it will get you over the edge of weakness and into the realm of strength. In the, the winner's circle. Yes. There you go. That's a good way to put it. I, that's a good mm. explanation. A yeah. little bit esoteric, a little bit, but oh, thanks. good. Nonetheless, thanks. yes. FlipsideCanvas.com. If you want a visual representation of the path that you can stare at every day when you wake up in the morning, hang on your wall, my brother Dakota Meyer is making art. No, he's making graphic representations of the path that you can get. FlipsideCanvas.com. Boom. Yes. So get some of that. Also, on it. On it.com. Go to on it.com slash Jocko. This is where you can get workout gear. Various other things, uh, some some good electrolyte, magnesium. I don't know all the little m- minerals or whatever, but that's a to me that's like a go to mm. as far as recovery performance. I don't know. It's good for a lot of stuff, but it's a, that's a daily one as well. Anyway, but the kettlebells that I get, hundred percent on it, hundred percent artistic ones go there. There's a lot of cool stuff on there, is what I'm saying. On got a bunch. Got a bunch of books. Right now, I have a new book. It's available for pre order. If you want to let my publisher know that they should print a lot of these books, then go and pre-order Leadership Strategy and Tactics Field Manual. Not to mention, you know you you know you don't want to get the second edition. No, you know what's how many chances do you to get get to get a first edition? One. You get one shot. 
Don't blow it. Don't blow it. As soon as as soon as soon humanly possible, I'm going to have them make a slight change to the cover. Second edition, I'm going to make it different. Oh, uh, so they to, missed out. Like, just, to, obviously. just so I can tell. PID, positive identification from a distance. Oh, that's cool. I see you got the book. I'll sign it for you. <laughs> but I realized where you were at yeah. when the when the when the chips were on the table, mm-hmm. you weren't there. You're in the which back is fine. Waiting. Order that first edition, leadership strategy and tactics field manual. Where the warrior kid three, that just came out. Where there's a will, it is live. So bust them. And then of course we have where the warrior kid one and two, and you know how many bad reviews I've gotten on those books. Oh man, zero. Mm. Yeah, it's man. I think well, you did get a bad review from someone who didn't not only didn't read it but didn't even know what it was about. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That? that one guy called. That one guy called and said it looked like a bunch of toxic masculinity <laughs> for children or something crazy like that. Yes, I just reposted that. About ten million people ordered the book as soon as they saw that guy. <laughs> Whatever that idiot's name was. Well, you know, in his his defense, I mean, he did speak too soon. He that's all. That was his mistake. He yeah. spoke too soon, like without looking into it. You, you see what I'm saying yeah. like that. And actually, you it know what huge. I did? I, 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 of course, just said, hey, if you want, I'll send you one so you can actually read it before yeah. you make your judgment. See, that's what and he should have done. But what, what really happened then is a lot of people jumped on and said, hey, I'm a woman. My my daughter loves this book. And then someone right. else said, hey, this book teaches people how to be respectful. Hey, this person teaches yeah. everyone. Just, and he finally oh. relinquished his, he, he oh. recanted. Yeah, had and apologized. To. Had to, bro. His yeah. own fans, like yeah. his own fans, were like, so "Hey, bro, my, I love your stuff. You're wrong on this, yeah, bro. Because you gotta right. look into People it." People just came off the top. That's what's funny. Even my comical sort of overreaction of that guy being an idiot. I didn't do that, of course, because I'm, yeah. you know, not gonna do that. But that, if I would have reacted that way. You know, people would have said, "Hey, Jocko, you know, you're being too aggressive." He, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I would have yeah. been the bad guy. So instead, yeah. I just say, "Hey, man, I'll send you a copy if you want it." Yeah, and then you can read it. But then everyone else it wasn't me that convinced him. It was everyone else. Yes, it was the 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 it was the troopers from the, coming. Well, it was heart, troopers coming at him hard, kind of. Yeah, you mean the well, not even hard. They were all everyone just everyone. I mean, there was a couple of people that was, took a little stab varying at Varying degrees yeah. of hardness, but yeah, a lot of people sure. were just like, "Hey, you should you should actually check it out because it's yeah. gonna, it would help you yeah. actually as a human being be better." So he essentially got got. Corrected by yeah. people who actually read the book. And I'll give up. him a little bit of credit. He re- he recanted and said, "Okay, cool. Yeah. I'm I'm wrong. I shouldn't have jumped the conclusions." Okay, cool. cool. So technically, so is that a bad review? Technically, no, because he didn't read the book. Good point. You can't, you can't review something you didn't experience. That is true. So there's that. There's there's Mikey and the dragons. This should be with every child. Mm-hmm. The book should be with every child. Mikey and the Dragons. Get this book for every kid that you know. Get it for the library. Get it. Yeah. The field manual. Discipline course Freedom field manual. Get that book for anyone that you know that you actually care about as a human so that you can keep them on the path. And then, of course, there's extreme ownership. There's the dichotomy of leadership. The first books that I wrote with my brother, Leif Babin, about leadership and how you can take leadership that we used on the battlefield and apply it to your life. We got Echelon Front, which is my leadership consultancy, where we come into organizations and solve whatever the problems that they have through the one thing that matters, and that's leadership. Go to echelonfront.com for details on that. EF Online, that is, since leadership training is not an inoculation, you need repetitive training to get the skills down. So we made EF Online, efonline.com interactive training in leadership through the interwebs. We also have the muster. Chicago's done. Uh, Denver, sold out, sorry. Sydney, Australia is next, December 4th and 5th. So if you wanna come to that, register now so you're not emailing Jamie and saying, hey, we we didn't get to put our things in in time. Is there any more seats? Because there's not. Mm -hmm. Sold out means we sold it out. We're not like, well, you know, we'll 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 sell it out, but we have a hundred more seats. No, mm-hmm. it's literally sold out. Yeah. So if you want to go, then go to extremeownership.com and register. And then of course we have EF Overwatch where we are taking leaders from special operations and combat aviation and putting them into the civilian sector. So 
go to EFOverwatch.com. If you're a company that needs leadership, which you are, or if you're a spec ops guy, combat aviation guy that is looking to move on to their next mission in the civilian sector, go to EFOverwatch.com. And if you feel like you need more than the 500 hours that we have spent talking on the podcast, then you can find us on the interwebs, on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Dufazbach. Echo is at Echo Charles, and I am at Jocko Willink. And like I said, if you want to help out Saved in America, you can follow them. They are on the same platforms at Saved in America. And thanks once again to Master Chief Kirby Harrell for his service in the teams. And it's literally like I told him, it's given me everything that I am right now. That's what these old team guys did for me. And also, obviously, thanks to Kirby for what him and his team is doing right now with SavedInAmerica.org. They are out there rescuing children, and I don't know if there is a more noble cause than that. So thank you, Master Chief Kirby Harrell. The rest of our military out there, that also gives us everything that we have. Thank you for doing what you do so that we can freely do what we do. And to our police and to law enforcement and firefighters and paramedics and EMTs and dispatchers and correctional officers and Border Patrol and Secret Service and to every other first responder, thanks for what you do as well for being on call each and every day to protect us. And to everyone else out there, when I think about someone like Master Chief, who has given so much, but you know what, just keeps on giving. And I ask myself, what what else can I give to the world? Ask yourself that same question. What else can you give to the world? Whose life can you make better? How much more can you give? Let's find out. Get up, move forward, and get after it. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko, out.